Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Henn. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mr. Christian Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the April 5th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I'm not aware of any changes or additions to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and to eight, consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairman McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 and D5? So move, Thomas. Thank you, do I, do I have a second? Second, second Mac. Thank you, any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hamm? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. First position is coordinator, placement in the Department of Special Education, and the second position is school safety manager in the Department of School Safety. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So, so moved, moved, Ms. Causey. Second, Thomas. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? Sure. Thank you. Our first appointment is Crystal M. Adams from Specialists in Compliance in the Department of Special Education to Coordinator of Placement, Department of Special Education. She brings to us 16 years of experience uh, in Baltimore, I'm sorry, previous experience in Baltimore City Public Schools, Ms. Crystal M. Adams. Thank you. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Neil G. J. Hicks 
as a school safety manager in the Department of School Safety. He is new to BCPS. Currently, he is the safety and security manager in Willow Valley Communities. He served as a director of security, uh, security lead supervisor in Frederick Community College, as well as police operations sergeant in the Maryland Transit Administration Police Force for over 20 years. Congratulations to Neil G.J. Hicks, and welcome. Thank you. Congratulations and welcome. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see the time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Bosch Ferrone with the Central Area Education Advisory Council. Dr. Ferrone? No, Dr. Ferrone with us? No. Okay. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Amy Adams. Oh, Dr. Ferrone. Can I take one minute to turn my computer on? Otherwise, I. Sure, if you'd like to wait on deck at the table here. Um, Ms. Adams, would you like to? Good evening. If, if you would like to turn your computer on Ms. while Ms. Adams Thank you. speaks. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I would like to speak to you tonight on two topics, academic and school safety. Last meeting, Dr. McComas and team presented quarter two data on attendance suspensions and grades. A principal of a local high school was here to share how 75% of his kids were earning C's or better. Looking at the Maryland report card from 2019, 10th graders at that very school tested at 14% proficient in ELA and less than 5% of students tested proficient in algebra one. Tonight's graduation presentation was not available prior to the meeting on board docs. Something that was available in the attachments for tonight's BAT presentation was justification for the need to purchase yet another reading curriculum and materials because, and I quote, currently only about one third of our students are meeting grade level literacy. Is this a data point we can rely on? I will ask this question of you all again. If 67% of elementary school kids or all students, it's unclear to me, are not meeting grade level literacy, how does BCPS graduate 87 to 89% of students each year? Being able to read is the key to equity. If a student cannot read, they cannot be successful in any other subject. The appearance of success without actual success is not acceptable. 
Second, our schools are not safe. Every day, multiple disruptive and violent incidents are occurring at schools all around the county. Kids and staff are getting hurt to the point they need medical treatment or hospitalization. There are videos and they are extremely disturbing to watch. Parents and teachers come to our coalition seeking support. We instruct them to fill out the BHI form and meet with school admins. We encourage them to file a report with the Maryland Safe School Hotline or website. And when necessary, we encourage them to talk to the SRO or local precinct to file a report. I've heard that principals are recommending disciplinary action, but whoever's involved in the process above them is not following through it as it has been done in the past. It's a small group of kids most likely have underlying issues that are creating havoc in the schools. The instability is not conducive to learning. In fact, teachers are telling us their classrooms are so chaotic, no learning is happening. That's a quote. The community has been speaking to you about the violence in schools since September, at least, but this really isn't a new problem, just worsening. We're now in the fourth quarter, and the situation is at a high crisis level, and yet we see and hear little from Dr. Williams to reassure us that you're all actively working to make it better and make schools safe. Are alternative schools successful in helping address this problem? Our teachers are deflated and some are scared and anxious. They can see when a child is starting to spiral out of control. If they're reporting it but no one is intervening before an incident occurs, why would they choose to stay? If you're a child who is a victim of bullying or a victim of one of these fights, why would you want to come back to school? How could you sit in a class and concentrate knowing it could happen again? We talk about trauma and mental health issues in kids. Simply attending school should not be traumatic. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ferron. See your Madam Chair, are we talking about advisory councils or yes. policies? Yes. You are signed up to speak on behalf of the Central Area Advisory first. Perfect. Now I am coordinated. I'm really excited today. Tomorrow, the Central Area will be presenting about uh, issues related to the school system. And we have four speakers. The first speaker is the one and only student board member, Mr. Christian Thomas. Second speaker is well known to the board, uh, Ms. Kim Ferguson, who has been honored last board meeting, and also Dr. Kevin Roberts and both will be speaking about the issues of uh, student behavior. Our fourth speaker is a doctor, Dr. Guyton, Delegate Guyton, who will be presenting about the role of administ uh, legislator. My goal, our goal as a team, is to present the issue of behavior from different angles because obviously, behavior issues are home, school, after school, and also uh, the legislator is involved with it. Uh, it is a Zoom meeting. Uh, all are welcome. And uh, we hope that we'll have, uh, I'm sure we'll have very informative uh, meeting. So thank you very much. That's really our uh, topic for tomorrow. Thank you. Our next general public comment speaker is Timothy Getz. Good evening. Good evening. I'm glad I made it on time because you guys are a little ahead of schedule, so thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Hello, my name is Tim Getze, and I have three children in Baltimore County Public Schools. Per the rules, I only have three minutes to voice my comments to the board. I have many comments related to the board, but the three minutes requires me to be selective and to the point. This draws parallels to the amount of time available for students to learn in school. The academic data shows that <clears throat> public schools are failing to, at their purpose of preparing children with a basic level of knowledge to be successful adults after high school graduation. If schools are failing at this basic concept, then the real question is why? Why does this problem even exist? What happened over the years where the American education system used to be the best and now it is on the verge of not being competitive? We all know there are only so many hours in a day, so if schools are failing to teach basic academics, then what are they teaching? Why isn't there an effort to reprioritize the curriculum to focus on basic academics? 
If the proficiency levels in reading and math are so incredibly poor, then why not take five to 10 minutes away from non-reading and math subjects and allocate the time to math and reading? Why not simplify the, the disciplinary process to immediately remove uncooperative students from the classroom so teachers don't get bogged down in addressing the uncooperative student so they can continue to teach? This school system and state already failed the students when schools were shut down over a political pandemic, and now is the time to correct those poor decisions. Over a month ago, the board refused to make an obvious favorable decision to remove masks from children, stating that metrics need to be the basis for removal of masks. Well, I have to ask, when are metrics going to be used to remove people that are failing to do their job? When, when, when are people going to be held accountable for the poor performance of the school system? There is only so much time in a day to teach children, and it's about time that the school system starts trying to find ways to optimize student learning instead of following the same old failed script. On another note, I recommend that the board dissolve the equity committee. I have listened to numerous meetings on this topic and am left disgusted by the committee's focus on race and truly what positive impact has it had other than a superficial one. I was appalled by the last meeting when I listened to <clears throat> I listened to when the committee verbally scoffed at the notion of adding religious discrimination to their equity poster. In this, in place, I recommend the creation of a safe classroom committee to focus on policy revisions to address the current behavioral crisis in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Maureen Burke. Good evening. Good evening, all. My name is Maureen Burke, and I'm a teacher at Delaney High School. I've been teaching at Delaney for 24 years. I'm here to talk to you about a challenging issue we face in Baltimore County Public Schools, the level of violent behavior and the lack of consequences for those students committing these acts. There is violence occurring on a daily basis in our schools, and it must be addressed. Yesterday, we had three different fights during third period alone. I emailed the full board on March 29th and included a video from a recent fight. In my email, I pointed out the two teachers who were in the middle of the fight, trying to break it up, and as a result, were injured because they were both punched multiple times. They had to seek medical attention and were out for two days. Teachers have a gut instinct to get involved in a fight because we have relationships with our students and we want to help because we don't want to see our students hurt each other. We often find the same students are involved in multiple fights, yet the consequence from the board designee this school year has only been a two-week suspension. If BCPS only suspends students for two weeks for violent acts, the message BCPS is sending to these students is that it's okay to fight and cause harm in our schools. The message BCPS is sending to other students who follow the rules and staff is their safety and security is not, is not a priority. I myself was in the middle of a big fight in the spring of 2018 and I was injured. Those students were sent to an alternative school and didn't return to Delaney for the rest of that school year. This used to be the consequence for violent acts and rightfully so. No amount of behavior plans, class changes, teacher, parent and counselor meetings are going to change this behavior in the home school. We are not equipped to deal with these issues. We already have other available options such as alternative schools, extended learning programs, Saturday school, and we now have a virtual learning model. Maybe we could create a specific virtual option for students who have difficulty at their home school. Rosedale is the alternative school for Delaney. Rosedale has psychologists, counselors, social workers, emotional, social learning supports, smaller classes and a shorter school day so students can work on their issues in the hopes of returning to their home schools. Rosedale can hold 75 students and, of last week, and as of last week, 43 were enrolled, while Delaney is a school of close to 2,000 students. I've had a number of students who have attended Rosedale, received the extra services and support they need, and then came back to Delaney and were successful. Teachers want to teach and the vast majority of students really want to learn. Teachers and students do amazing work in schools every day, 
And in order for that to happen effectively, safety and security needs to be priorities in Baltimore County Public Schools. We already have some resources to address these issues and we need to use them. Our schools need your help. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Sharon Saroff. Is she here? I don't see her. Okay, Darren Badillo. I don't see either. Sherry Williams. Good evening. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity. I am here as a representative of the Parent Teacher Association at Deer Park Middle Magnet School. I am proud to say I have the pleasure of forming relationships with parents, students, and other community members for the past 18 years as a special educator at Deer Park Middle Magnet and as a community member for the past 30 years. At the beginning of the school year, with a population of 1,600 students in a one-floor building, social distancing was not possible. No social distance, distancing inside classrooms, common areas, and or the cafeteria. Kudos to the administra administration that I work under. They've tried many strategies, but to no avail. If anyone can tell me how to socially distance 1,600 middle school students in a one floor building, I will gladly take it back to my, uh, the information back to my administration and we will try it, I guarantee it. Please understand, we appreciate the trailers. We started at three um, trailers shortly after the beginning of the school year. We are now currently up to seven trailers at, at present. However, what we need more than trailers, which are a temporary fix, is a boundary study to be completed sooner than later. Current families and students, our students do care, as well as incoming families within the Owings Mills and Newtown Corridor deserve to know what to expect as soon as possible. It has been 24 years since an extension was added to Deer Park Middle Magnet School. We need more at this point. Trailers are a temp temporary fix. We need a boundary study to take a deep dive into what will truly and positively impact the students and staff of Deer Park Middle Magnet School, as well as the surrounding communities. We need another middle school in the Newtown Owings Mills corridor to alleviate the overcrowding at Deer Park Middle Magnet School. I thank you for your time. Rise above. Thank you. Next is Mary Taylor. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Scott. I mean, Chair Scott, sorry, Chair Scott. <laughs> Apology. Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and the Board of Education members. Uh, with an already uncomfortable classroom climate where teachers and students don't feel safe, legislators are introducing more N0 tolerance legislation. What's really disheartening is that Maryland State Education Association, who represents the Maryland teachers, and the Maryland Association of Education, who represents Maryland Board of Education members, including our Baltimore County Public School BOE, supported this legislation, legislation with a favorable testimony. Maryland Senate Bill SB 119 and House Bill 0084 is a horrific bill sponsored and supported by Democratic legislators. This bill is designed to foster a hostile school environment and to make our schools unsafe in the name of social justice. This gives exclusive rights to the lawless and promotes criminal activity. 
What about the social justice and rights of the students that are there to learn and teachers there to teach? This bill reads, specifying that provisions of law prohibiting and penalizing disruptive and threatening behavior on the grounds of, in the classes of, or in the home of an employee of an institution of elementary, secondary, or higher education do not apply to students who commit offenses at the institution they attend, students on exclusionary discipline who commit offenses at the institution they attend, or students who commit offenses at other institutions while attending a sporting event or extracurriculum programs. Basically, it's a bill that prohibits, yes, it prohibits kids from being removed from classrooms, et cetera, if they are being violent. This rationale is that this will protect kids who get in fights in classrooms from having a criminal record. And we wonder why our kids are in mental distress and good teachers are leaving our schools. Parents need to be reminded that the schools will not and cannot guarantee the safety of their children while they are held on school property all day, period. The schools may not want to admit it, but that doesn't mean it's not a fact. That said, the school also cannot and will not guarantee the safety of their own staff while they're on their job. Our children, our schools are being destroyed and no one is acting. The safety of our children is critical for them to be able to learn. Discipline, respect, and accountability are the three things it takes to grow a decent, productive citizen. Please end zero consequences and save our schools, make them safe again. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Ramona Basilio. Good evening. Good evening, Chairperson Hen, representatives of the board, guests from the community. My name is Ramona Basilio. I work with a network of parents, students, and community members in the greater Deer Park Middle Magnet area. You've heard from one of our colleagues in the PTA about our overcrowding situation. Um, I had a whole speech lined up, but I think I'm going to separate from that for a moment. I want to use this time, this very public opportunity, to thank members of the board, Superintendent Williams, members from the staff. I see Mr. Thomas over there who was at the county executive meeting advocating for students. For your work since and before the pandemic, I remember sitting and getting an email from my PTA president at 2 a.m. on that March 23rd counseling events, saying give students refunds for their spring dance, saying that the senior dance would not happen. I recall Dr. Williams being on the job maybe all of eight, nine months, and I thought, my God, I wouldn't do that for anything in the world, in the middle of a pandemic, the beginning of it. So I just want to use this very public time to thank you all for the work that you do and not letting all the time politics get in the way of your passion for our students and keeping students at the center. I sit before you representing three students who I met in the last week. Two young Hispanic boys who through their tears and through their interpreter asked for safety, talked about baseball bats in school, asking the school board do something. I sit before you in the memory of a recent Deer Park staff person who said to me two months before she passed, and she passed doing what she loved, working at Deer Park. Make a difference, rise above, address the overcrowding. Nancy, rest in power. To the board, your job is magnificent. You couldn't pay me, wouldn't pay me, wouldn't accept doing it at all. But know that we hear you, we see you, politics notwithstanding. I've been following the board for the last five superintendents in the interim. It's not an easy job. And there are resources that have to be spread around. <coughs> we want to thank you for being the Solomon, solving the problem and not splitting the baby. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
Next is Cynthia Koenig. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Cynthia Koenig. Um, I'm here to address the school violence. My question to you is, why is it that the violence has increased and the punishments have decreased? When did we become more concerned with being too harsh with the discipline of the bullies and the attackers than we are with the safety of the other children? Why does it seem as if the administration is far more concerned with the image of the school than the actual happenings going on within the school? On March 10th, my child was violently attacked on a BCPS bus by a classmate, all while other children stood by and recorded, then shared to social media as if it were just a means of entertainment. There was video footage from multiple angles showing the vicious attack. When the Perry Hall Middle School principal reported to the scene, she addressed students, other parents, the bus driver, and the head of the local bus lot. She never addressed me or the responding BCPD officer. She never sent any kind of communication to the parents of the children on the bus to inform them of what had taken place. And I left multiple messages for her to call back regarding the incident. She never responded to not one of them. My child's attacker was only given a two-day suspension a two-day suspension for violently stomping my child's head into the bus floor, which resulted in a large, bloody head laceration and a concussion. Not only did he physically harm my child, but he mentally traumatized him. He has had nightmares and is constantly on edge. That punishment doesn't really seem to fit the crime. The day after he returned from his measly two-day suspension, he physically assaulted my child again in the hallway. My son wrote a statement regarding this follow-up incident, and nothing was done. They insisted on forcing multiple mediation sessions after the attack of... Pardon me, Ms. Koenig. Um, specific matters we're not allowed to hear as, as a board. I do. A, if you would like to speak in general towards violence in schools, unfortunately, because of our role, we cannot hear specific student or employee matters. If you would like to speak in general. Sure. Um... I guess my concern is I don't understand why the bullies and the attackers, just like literally everyone who's come before me has said, why are they the ones that are protected? Why aren't they, why aren't they sent to alternative schools? Why, why are the consequences not enough to deter these children from acting like this, from physically assaulting other children? Why is my child not safe? Why, as of last Friday, did I have to remove my child from his school to ensure his safety? I shouldn't have to do that. What if it was your child? And the fact that the administration has not only done nothing, but been completely unresponsive is unbelievably frustrating to me. And all I will say is something needs to change. At some point, we need to be addressing the fact that our children are not safe walking the halls of our schools or riding our school buses. What if it was your child? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Lloyd Allen. Yes. Good evening. Ramadan Mubarak. Uh, thank you, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Lloyd Allen. I have not been given a sign name and so don't actually have standing for my remarks tonight, but I'm a special educator in mathematics and I noticed that a course sequence is implied in our grad requirement options, uh, but does not exist in our catalog. Completer programs are part of the graduation requirements. Some students do a career completer like carpentry or cosmetology. Some students use a language like German or Japanese to meet the college completer. Graduation requirements are listed in Comar and they were updated in about 2007 to include ASL as a recognized language. In 2002, I took uh, ASL through BCPS as a teacher in an in-service course. I was a general educator at a school that had a DHH, deaf and hard of hearing cluster, and it was reasonable to assume that I would be the math teacher for a deaf student. So learning at least enough ASL to perform mathematics seemed like a good idea. And man, if I had had ASL in high school or earlier, would that have helped my own comprehension? I learned that ASL has a different grammar than the Latin, Spanish, French, and English that I had learned in school. Learning ASL helped me to think in a different way, one that speaks to processing mathematics. Rather than subject, verb, object, ASL uses time, topic, comment. Now, I'm talking to you uh, about ASL. 
So in the future, a class about ASL, can we have one? In that, uh, in that class, one of the first words that I learned was seek. You make a C hand and move it in front of your face like so. So in the catalog, uh, that class, ASL, I looked for it, but it's not there. We're 15 years behind. So there are five things. Maryland's governor's office of DHH, which just celebrated its 20th birthday, gave a conservative estimate of 760,000 DHH Marylanders in 2016. ASL is intrinsic to deaf culture. CODA just won the Academy Award for Best Picture, Best Writing, and the SAG Award for Outstanding Performance by a Cast in a Motion Picture. And now the acronym for Child of Deaf Adult is in our vernacular. The White House just hired its first full-time ASL interpreters. Our own job listings include DHH teacher as well as adult assistant with basic ASL skills. Why aren't we setting ourselves up for success by putting students on the path to fill our own vacancies? We're not self-sustaining. With no written component, ASL removes a barrier to learning for students with reading disabilities. ASL is still plenty difficult, don't worry, it's rigorous. Uh, and Towson University has a deaf studies program. College Park may be joining them in that soon. And down the street, there is another university, Gallaudet. At the least, don't we owe our own deaf students the chance to rigorously learn the language that is their birthright? And shouldn't we facilitate communication with all of our peers? I'm looking in this year's course catalog and I don't see ASL, but maybe for the 23-24 catalog, can we catch up to the events of 22? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Darren Badillo. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I just want us all to just take a step back and just put ourselves in our children's shoes who attend Baltimore County Schools, if we could do that for a moment. Um, you see fights every day in school and on social media. Uh, you yourself might even be a victim of bullying, harassment, intimidation, and that also might be posted on social media that you get to see every day. Uh, no one's doing nothing about it. And then the child who's consistently disrupting class continues to get away with it, and the teacher does nothing to hold them accountable because they're afraid. How do you think that this can affect our children? And I would say it's negatively. You know, let's talk about last Tuesday. A uh, student hits another student with a bat at Willow High School. A uh, teacher gets assaulted by a student at Kenwood High School. Uh, then the police have to come back to Kenwood because of a fight. Then there was two fights at Stricker Middle School as well. How do you think the children felt when they saw another kid get hit with a baseball bat? How do you think the, ch think the children in the classroom felt when they see another student hit a teacher? Or when the big fight happened? Or when the two fights at Stricker? Well, I'll give you a little example. I got a text from a parent. I'm not going to share any names, but share with their student. Their child sent them, Mom, there was a fight right in front of me. Where? In class? No, in the hallway when we're switching periods. My friend got beat up so bad he got knocked out. Mom, I'm shaking, I'm scared. Are you at lunch now? About to be mom, there's another one. What do you mean, fight? Yes, one in the bathroom with two girls, then the other one I just witnessed. We have a major issue with discipline, fighting, intimidation and bullying in our school, we can't push it under the rug no more. It is bad, however bad you think it is, it's 10 times worse. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, and if you're that child and you, you see all that going on um, and you really feel like nobody cares, um, and I know we care. Um, so if I can make a couple suggestions, one, we just need to hold children accountable and we need to have a no hands policy in our schools. We need to place those children who don't know how to, who don't understand boundaries and don't know how to act in a class setting, we need to put them in alternative schools. We need to bring their parents into the conversation and have their parents sit in class with them for a day or that child cannot come back. We have a major issue with the violence going on in our schools and it's boiling over, it's been happening since the beginning and now we're seeing people bringing weapons to school. Um, this button right here, this is a pin of Michael, a young child in Baltimore County School that took his life. If you don't step up and do something about this violence, you're gonna see a lot more of that. Thank you. Sharon Saroff. 
Good evening. Throughout the school year, I've tried to bring to your attention concerns in the area of special education and communication. I've even given you some helpful suggestions on how to improve these areas. I wonder if anyone's listening because I'm not seeing any improvement. I've raised issues of timelines. I use an important tool it helps me to keep track of timelines for my own clients. If, let's say, January 1st, I have a client who is getting assessments, I know that 60 days from that point, we have to come back and talk about those assessments. That is a hard and fast rule by federal law, not something that we can change off the cuff. And that is what is happening in the school system. We, are, we seem to be making up the rules as we go along. What does that say to students? It says we don't care. And as we just heard, we are, are having more significant violence in the schools and more significant negative behaviors in the schools. And parents are bringing issues to your attention and you're not listening. That needs to change. We have a motto in the school system. We're supposed to be raising the bar, closing the gap, and providing for the future. How are we doing that right now? I don't think we're doing a very good job when the gap between special ed kids and general ed kids is getting bigger because we're not paying attention to parent concerns. I'm a parent. Pay attention. Because I'm a required member of that IEP team. Pay attention to the fact that if you're not closing that gap, you are not preparing for the future. You are not raising the bar. Thank you. Thank you. Next is public comment on board policies. First, we have board policy 3200, purchases from minority and small business enterprises. And for that, we have Dr. Bosch Farone. Good evening to all. Uh, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Williams, audience. I'd like to change the tone a little bit. Uh, policy 3200, 30, 3209, and 3210 look really good to me. I read all five policies. I don't have any critique to the three policies I mentioned to you. I just want to praise the PRC for the choice of words, for the updates, and I know how much hard work both the PRC and the law office puts in these policies. Words means a whole lot, um, and I, I just really want to make sure that, um, at least for me, as a resident of uh, this county and as a frequent critic in the past, is not to just criticize, not just criticize, but also to praise the school system when they do really well. Um, so I, I thank you for all three of them. I have comments on the other two whenever you say. Thank you. And um, 3209, to clarify, is on purchasing principles, and 3210 is purchasing guidelines. So thank you, um, Dr. Fern, for those. And the next policy is 5100, compulsory attendance, if you'd like to That's speak to that. Okay. So 
I like you to think of, of this policy, 5100. Line item number seven, the board believes that the attending school, attending school regularly is linked to academic achievement and is paramount in ensuring that all students will graduate from high school to be college or career ready and prepared to be globally competitive citizens. And I really like that very, very much. What I like to praise the PRC uh, is for putting an asterisk or something like that on the word regularly and defining it. If you remember in my last critique uh, of other policies, I basically criticized the PRC for not really explaining words that are elastic, that are rubbery in nature. And I really appreciate that it has been done in this policy. Uh, it makes it much clearer and less chance for uh, misinterpretation, uh, abuse, and so forth. So I thank you really for, for that very much. That's the only comment I have on 5100. And we have one other speaker on 5100, so if you'd like to stay there. And I'm going to call on Sharon Zaroff to speak on policy 5100. I like where you're going with this. However, I think we have to take into consideration why students aren't attending school and what we need to do to fix that. That needs to go, I think, in the policy as well. Um, and if, for instance, is the violence that's going on um, and that parents need to have a voice and need to have their voice heard about supplying a safe environment. It's not just that attendance equals a good outcome. The other thing is, attendance doesn't always equal a good outcome. I can sit in the classroom and twiddle my thumbs and not gain any benefit from that class. You have to make sure that you're addressing the, the needs of the child and not just addressing that attendance. And if you have to link it to another policy, I think you need to do so. So I like where you're going, but it needs improvement. Thank you. And you're both signed up for the next policy as well. However, our first speaker on the next policy is our incoming student board member, Ms. Roa Hassan. And this is on board policy 5120, attendance and excuses. Welcome. No, you're welcome to stay. And Dr. Ferron, you're welcome to, to stay as well. You're signed up for this policy as well. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, student member of the board Christian Thomas, and members of the BCPS Board of Education. My name is Roa Hassan. I'm a junior at Perry Hall High School and the 42nd BCPS student member of the board-elect. Thank you. <laughs> These past few months, I've had the opportunity to speak to students across the county. And this past year, I've had the opportunity to hear the unwavering student voice and the needs they've expressed. Today and as we continue, I look forward to sharing not only my voice, passion, and expertise, but the power of all 111,000 students. Today and every day, we unconditionally fight for our needs and for the power of the students. As you address policy 5120 regarding student attendance and excuses, I ask you to consider the weight of our mental health needs. To consider the fact that a disproportionate amount of school absences are closely related to mental health needs and struggles. I ask you to remember and humanize the loss we've collectively experienced, to consider the suicides, the depression and anxiety rates, to consider the undeniable trauma students have experienced within the past two years of a global pandemic. We are experiencing an epidemic of mental illness in young people, and we must begin to continue to hold empathy for the thousands of students who experience the adverse effect of mental illness. We must consider that the manner in which our system currently functions is an immense stressor for so many students and is often a significant and root cause of our mental health st struggles and its continuation. 
As a student who has experienced mental health struggles and their impacts first and second hand, I cannot exaggerate the benefit and necessity of excused mental health absences. Mental health absences have become essential to ensuring not only that we're able to function, but able to succeed as students and as individuals in a system that does not guarantee our mental wellness from the beginning. Our students deserve the opportunity to recover in an environment that they need without being punished for it, being punished for tending to their needs. I ask that you guarantee the needs of students are seen and applied as you considered board, pol board policy 5120. This board policy must include an explicit statement of mental health absences as an excused absence for student attendance and guarantee that mental health be used as a metric for those absences. This guarantee is one that holds consideration for social emotional needs of students across the county in correspondence to the rigor of the academic calendar as well as our needs. I ask you to begin addressing our needs, to begin addressing the epidemic that is, student mental, that is the student mental health crisis and to truly begin to hear and value the needs of the students in every single decision you make as a board member and as a collective body. We deserve a system that prioritizes student wellness over numbers and data. We deserve a system that considers the tragedies. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Sharon Seroff. I want to say that we're very lucky to have this incoming student board member because she is really articulately saying what needs to be said. And I want to kind of piggyback on that by saying that yes, students need to have their mental health needs addressed appropriately. That includes not punishing parents and students if they can't access resources in the community. Our resources in the community are so stretched that there are waiting lists two years long and more. We need to address some of those needs within the school environment and recognize that those needs do impact adversely the way our students learn and the attendance in general. So we really do need to take that mental health piece into consideration and recognize that it's important, especially now after this pandemic, with all the trauma that these students have been experiencing over the past now going on three years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Farone? Which policy, Madam Chair? Yes, 5120, attendance and excuses. 5120 looks wonderful to me. Thank you. <laughs> Next is public comment on board policy 5480, pregnant and parenting students. And Ms. Seroff, you're signed up first. I have had, um, as a teacher, I have had to address that kind of a concern in my classroom. Uh, before I came to Maryland, I had experienced several times students in my classroom who were dealing with pregnancies, and again, they could not access dealing with those pregnancies or getting to school. And we have to recognize that these students still need services. These students may still want to learn and provide them with alternative ways to access their learning when they're pregnant. Thank you. Dr. Farron? 5480? Yes. All right. I am not really an articulate person, but I will do my best with this one. Uh, line item 13 on policy 5480 says, basis of sex in education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance, especially address legal issues regarding pregnancy, etc. So my thought to you for consideration is the use of the word sex. I recommend the use of the word gender. So Webster says the definition of sex is sexually motivated 
phenomena or behavior. And gender, to me, would be more appropriate use for it. Actually, in the MSDE model policy that is associated with this policy, when you click uh, Control F, you know, searching for words, uh, MSDE in relation to such an issue mentioned the word gender one time and mentioned the word sex one time. Uh, and when you look at the phraseology, they are basically using them interchangeably. So my thought is to use gender instead of sex. There is one other area in this policy, or maybe another policy in case that I missed it, that uh, the policy refers to the student as a child in the text. Uh, in other areas, the student is referred to as a student. So my thought, if, uh, if a student in elementary school, I mean, it's not going to happen, but if elementary school student reads the policy and sees the description of a child, not a big deal. If it is a middle school student, uh, it depends on you know the hormone levels and, and this and that. If a high school, student sees that, I think it would be um, not really positive uh, way. And I, I suggest instead of using the word child, using the word student or pupil, and that would be broad enough, generic enough, that would be respective, respectful and appreciative of students, whether they are high school, middle school, or whether they are elementary school. Not a big deal. Um, but words means a lot, and I thought I mentioned that to you. Thank you again, and my apology, I have to leave a little bit early. It's the month of Ramadan, so I don't feel strong enough to stay. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies, and for that I call on Ms. Lily Rowe, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendations to amend the following board policies. Board Policy 3200, Purchasing Purchases from Minority and Small Business Enterprises. Board Policy 3209, Purchasing Purchasing Principles. Board Policy 3210, Purchasing Purchasing Guidelines. Board Policy 5100, Enrollment and Attendance, Compulsory Attendance. Board Policy 5120, Enrollment and Attendance, Attendance and Excuses. And the Policy Review Committee asks the board accept the committee's recommendation on new board policy 5480, Services to Students, Pregnant and Parenting Students. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit G. Thank you. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Policies 3200, 3209, 3210, 5100, 5120, and 5480? Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Oh, was that your motion? No, thank you. I was going to ask if we could separate out 5120. Sure. Um, then the motion would be to accept the um, committee's recommendation for 3200, 3209, 3210, 5100, you wanted to separate? Sorry, 5120 is a separate, is one to separate. Okay, 5100 and 5480. Is there a motion, board members? So moved, Mac. Thank you, Ms. Mac. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just like a clarification from uh, Ms. Rowe, the Chair of the Policy Review Committee, that the vote that the board is taking is to move these recommendations to second reader, that it is not yet approving them, um, because the distinction is that we just heard from our community about um, input that they have, suggestions, comments, also uh, commendations, and we certainly appreciate those. Um, and so at the next meeting or at this meeting, there is still the opportunity to revise um, these policies. Yes, this is first reader. Thank you. Any other for any discussion? May I have a roll call, call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? 
Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee for policy 5120? So moved, Matt. Thank you. No second is needed. Is there any discussion? Mr. Thomas? Thank you, yes. Um, I move to insert and both physical and mental health student and both physical and mental student health needs to line 15 after students on page two. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor to be processed. Mr. Mercedes, what? Uh, this would be an amendment to, to amend, the motion. Yeah. To amend the motion to? Yes, to amend. To amend the motion. Would you please read your? Yes. Motion. Uh, one second. I move to amend the motion to accept with the language and both physical and mental health student needs to line 15 after students on page two. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Mr. Thomas? Thank you. And I'm just going to read out loud what that would uh, look like. So page. Okay, so basically, uh, section that, that A right there says all students are expected to attend school regularly and may be excused from class or school only for reasons specified in state regulation, including lawful absences for pregnant and parenting students, and this would add, and both physical and mental health student needs then or as authorized by the superintendent or his or her designee. And this is because when I was looking at the Maryland law that refers to student health, and I want to thank community input for also emailing me this, um, it doesn't really specify the difference between uh, lawful absences of student illness, whether those illnesses are mental or physical. And I think we need to explicitly state in our policy that we are going to be excusing students for absences that relate to illness, not just saying we're going to excuse them based on the law, but actually explicitly stating what the law I I is stating in these two important parts. And I think we've heard from our community that it is important that we are referencing mental health in our policy. And because the law um, it is, is very vague in some of its language, I think we need to take a stance as a board and, and incorporate this in the policy as they've done in other counties like Montgomery County. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Rowe, you have a question? Yes, I would just like to know um, from the legal opinion, what is the distinction between adding that language and does it functionally change anything we're already doing in our school system? Because my understanding is that if a student has a mental health um, issue and they are absent as a result of their mental health issue, that is considered already the same as a physical or medical issue. I just want to know if this language, if approved, would functionally change anything we're already doing. That rooms is. Ms. Howie available to speak to that? Good evening, members. Uh, I'm concerned about the local board trying to interpret what the state board has indicated and placed in its regulation. And I do not believe that a local board of education has that authority. Uh, so I would be concerned. I believe this was expressed in committee as well. I would be concerned with amending the policy to define in policy what is not defined in state regulation. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Does that answer your question, Ms. Rowe? No, but it's, in, it's good information on another count. Maybe staff could answer the question of whether or not we already excuse mental health um, situations. Dr. I mean, if, if a parent writes a note and says, my child was absent because of a um, mental health um, issue that they're having, is that an excused absence? We have Ms. Ferguson coming to the table. Ms. Ferguson. Yes. 
Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Yes, it is. An excuse absence if the parent writes a note uh, for her uh, child, it is an excuse absence. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson. Ms. Causey? Thank you, um, first of all, to the community for um, coming regularly and raising your concerns, and I appreciate Mr. Uh, Thomas making this motion and this discussion. I appreciate Ms. Ferguson coming. So um, in the current process, how many days uh, can a parent write a note without a doctor's note for illness? Uh, and is that tied wait. directly to MSDE regulations? I have to get back to you on that answer. I don't have the rule in front of me. That's in the rule, not in the policy. Okay. Dr. Hager, um, you had a comment? Um, I did, and um, I was just looking at the rule currently, and, and I, I've been very vocal that I'm a big fan of putting as much in the policy as possible. Um, however, there are 11 different excused absence reasons listed in the rule. Um, in addition to pregnancy and, um, and childbirth. And so I, I just, I'm, I'm concerned about putting pieces of the rule into the policy when, um, and not including all of the, the many reasons that, that children can be excused from school. Um, and I would hope, you know, and, and that's part of the reason that I, I feel this way about policy versus rule, that the updated rule would be more specific about mental health concerns, um, but, uh, but again, given the, the vast list of reasons that kids could be excused, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure about, about this amendment. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments, board members? I'll return to you. I, I will just add a comment and then I'll come to you, Mr. Thomas. I, I too am concerned about adding this as a distinction only because I feel it's inclusive, the policy is inclusive as is and that calling it out specifically while important, if our current policy already is inclusive of that, I don't know that it's necessary and mental health needs are as, as valid as physical health needs. They are included. And I'm concerned about the stigma, quite honestly, uh, that's so associated with mental health needs and the unintended consequence of calling it out as such. Um, a health need is a health need whether it is physical or, or mental. So um, while I, I don't, that's not the intent, it's quite the opposite, I, I worry about an unintended consequence of, of calling it out as such. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, to the point of, of Dr. Hager, um, I, I think in the policy right now, you know, we already say including lawful absences for parent, for pregnant and parenting students. And I'm wondering if we're already including one of the aspects of the state regulation as it is, I, I mean, although my, my amendment would only include the health needs, those illnesses that are outlined in, in, in the Maryland uh, legislation or, or law, then why aren't we including all of the 11 portions in the policy as it is? Um, so uh, the, 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 that's a question. I expressly, I expressly wanted to put this in the policy just because it is something that is not always taken into account when it comes to a student being absent. And from personal experience and from the experience of many other students across the county, we're not always excused for when we need to have that break and our parents might submit a note. Um, so I, I just wanted to make that very clear that I think it is important that we expressly put this in board policy and take a stance in, in, in respecting our students and respecting their mental health and physical health needs. Thank you. So I have a follow-up question, Ms. Ferguson. Um, is if a note is from a mental health provider, is that questioned any differently than from a student's pediatrician? It is not. It is not. A provider is a provider. A provider is a provider. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? Dr. Hager? Um, I just, again, want to clarify, and, and the rule is, a, is in an attachment to the policy, so if, if anyone wanted to pull up the rule. Um, but there is a section on lawful absences and then a section on pregnant and parenting pregnant and parenting students. And I assume that's that way through state law. Is that why we have them separated out? Yeah. So, so it's not that, that the, you know, it's illness inclusive of this. They are two separate kind of ways that state law looks yes. at this. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. And if there are no other comments or questions, Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Um, and I thank board members for the discussion. 
so just to clarify, Mr. Thomas doesn't have it in the chat. This is related to policy 5480 or 5120? 5120. Okay, thank you. And um, I guess what I don't want to make a motion about tonight, but I would ask um, maybe staff to consider um, is including those 11 in, in, into the board policy because they are specific, they are according to law. So it's not as if the board then is trying to interpret what the law says, which Ms. Howie indicated was a concern, mm -hmm. but rather we would spell out what the law says with those 11 items. So um, I appreciate this uh, motion at this time. I wouldn't support it just because I think it deserves more deliberation to make sure that we're doing, that we're achieving what, what we want, which is clarifying for the students, but also making it clear for, for all students, for all parents for all situations. Okay, thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? And we're voting on the Mr. Thomas's amendment. Ms. Rowe? Abstain. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Jose? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Hen? No. Thank you. The motion fails. Um, we are now going to process the original motion. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you. And give me one second to get back to it. Is there any um, discussion on the original motion to accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee on, I think we've discussed this, um, <laughs> 5120. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So in the policy review committee meeting, uh, we had a pretty extensive discussion on whether or not, or on how to determine those extracurricular activities um, that a student can be absent for. I just want to make it clear again that for students who are attending things like civic engagement, for students that maybe wanted to go to the state legislature and protest, for students that would be absent for things related to uh, clubs and activities that they're involved in, that those can be excused through, through, through the way this policy is written right now. And I just want to have staff make that statement, please. Well, I believe that was confirmed in committee and is on the record as staff confirmed. Okay. In committee. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions, board members? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Mm. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Abstain. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Board Chair Hinn, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board. I am pleased to present the superintendent's report to the board and Team BCPS. My report includes celebrations, operational updates, and evidence of our strategic plan the compass, our pathway to excellence in action. Uh, next slide, please. Team BCPS recently ended Music in Our Schools Month and Youth Art Month. As a system, we celebrate the conclusion of a successful Artist for Everyone exhibition at the Baltimore Museum of Art featuring more than 260 student artworks from 120 schools. 13 BCPS students earning national medals in the Alliance of Young Artists and, write and Writers prestigious scholastic art and writing program. The annual All County Honors Band Orchestra and Chorus Concerts, which showcased 377 students selected for the exceptional musicianship from 19 middle schools and 20 high schools. The 2022 BCPS Student Choreography Showcase is available online viewing. The showcase includes 24 dance works choreographed and performed by students from Dundalk High School, 
George Washington Carver Center for the Arts and Technology, Middle River Middle School, Milford Mill Academy, Newtown High School, Owings Mills High School, Parkville High School, and Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts. The first mural for parents and school community at Lions Mill Elementary School created by the Friday Morning Mural Club. And a shout out to the Kenwood CT Graphic and Print Program, whose members worked with the Kenwood Art Department to produce postcards featuring student artwork that staff will use to send positive notes home to families. Outstanding work team BCPS, congratulations to all of our talented artists and staff who supported them. Every year, the Baltimore County Public Schools Office of Visual Arts selects outstanding art educators to honor and recognize their effort in the classroom, teaching students, engaging in the school and community, and embodying the best practices of art education. This year, the Office of Visual Arts recognizes Erica Hamilton as the District Novice Secondary Art Educator of the Year through the Maryland Art Education Association. There she is. Congratulations, Ms. Hamilton and the Western School of Technology. Good row is still here. Middle and high school students from across Baltimore County have selected Perry Hall High School Junior Roa Hassan to serve as the student member of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for the 2022-2023 school year. A record 13,169 students cast online ballots on Thursday, March 17th. The number of votes cast this year is 61.6%, more than in 2020, when the previous record of 8,152 votes were cast. Hassan is the president of the Perry Hall Class of 2023 Senate. At her school, she is also vice president of Girls Up, events coordinator of the Muslim Student Association, historian of the Ro uh, Rotary Interact Club, and secretary of Mock Trial. Ms. Hassan tutors and mentors uh, Perry Hall avid sophomores. She's a member of the National Honor Society, Spanish Honor Society, and Social Studies Honor Society. At the county level, she is the co-legislative affairs coordinator for Baltimore County Student Councils. At the state level, she is the vice chair of the Maryland High School Democrats Women's Caucus, co-founder and co-executive director of Mike Up Maryland, and legislative coordinator of the Maryland Center for School Safety Student Focus Group. Congratulations, Roa Hassan. Let's acknowledge Roa. Congratulations to this year's finalists. Previous slide. There we go. This year's finalists for the BCPS Teacher of the Year. This year's finalists are Zach Davis, fourth and fifth grade teacher at Logan Elementary School, Tracy Dowling, mathematics department chair at Overly High School, Brent Dryson, fourth and fifth grade teacher at Deep Creek Elementary School. Alicia Freeman, ESOL teacher at Franklin Elementary School. Muriel Oluwokoa, fourth grade teacher at Bahattan, Powhatan Elementary School. And Heather Young, reading specialist at Charles Mount Elementary School. The six finalists will be interviewed by the selection panel this month to determine who among them will be named the 2022-2023 BCPS Teacher of the Year during a live stream April 28th ceremony. Can we acknowledge these finalists, please? <laughs> All right, next slide, please. This week, please join us in celebrating our amazing Team BCPS Assistant Principals. Take a moment to give your favorite Team BCPS Assistant Principal a shout out using the hashtag BCPSAPWeek. Assistant principals, we honor and thank you for your leadership, your support of students and school communities, your advocacy and passion, and everything else that you bring to your work every day. Can we acknowledge our assistant principals? Thank you. 
Next slide, please. We know that our efforts to heal, rebuild, and recover must be ongoing. Each and every day, we're seeing signs of progress. We are also seeing areas of additional need. That is why the FY23 budget proposal is focused on people and progress. I am hopeful that our funding partners will invest in Team BCPS and help us make our needs. Thank you for your continued dedication to our school communities. Next slide. While COVID-19 rates are much lower than they were in, in December and January, COVID-19 is still with us. As we head into spring break, we encourage staff and families to continue to take steps to protect themselves and others by getting vaccinated and boosted. More information about COVID-19 vaccines can be found on our COVID-19 webpage. Avoiding large indoor crowded spaces, and if you are in a large crowd indoors, consider testing yourself about five days after the event and staying home and getting tested if you have symptoms of COVID-19. We all have to work together to remain healthy as we look forward to the end of the year. During our last meeting, I provided a general overview of our system response to the safety needs of our school communities. To date, we have held four town halls where we heard from parents, survey our principals, work with student leaders to launch a peer-to-peer -peer campaign, equip our PTSA with tools to support their local schools, and conducted several school safety walks. Later this month, we will host a roundtable meeting with five neighboring school systems to share ideas related to school safety. Based on these opportunities to listen and learn, we have developed a course of action to ensure ongoing supports for our school communities. Our next steps include grant-funded student safety assistance at the secondary level, enhanced community partnership opportunities, revamp procedures to effectively communicate outcomes related to bullying and harassment investigations, and a widespread information campaign to promote the use of the Maryland Center for School Safety reporting tip line. Next slide. So the FY23 budget priorities principal survey identifies safety assistance as the third most frequently requested support for the upcoming year. Additionally, best practices and national models support the use of safety and security assistance in schools in addition to SROs. Specifically, according to the schoolsafety.gov, a website created by the federal government to provide schools and districts with actionable recommendations to create safe and supportive learning environments, security personnel can be invaluable resources to a school safety team because of their specialized knowledge in recognizing building security concerns and mitigating violent situations. Their presence in schools allows them to build relationships with students that can prevent or mitigate school violence. BCPS will pilot the use of secondary school safety assistance in select schools with the goal of full implementation in the fall of 2022. In the fall, these grant funded positions will be equitably uh, allocated based on enrollment, receive summer professional development to include team BCPS expectations, school expectations, and participation in safe school training, and focus on maintaining a safe and supportive environment through a proactive presence. These positions are not replacing SROs, but will support school teams. Next slide. In preparation for a full fall launch, we are looking to respond to immediate needs as well as inform the system-wide rollout. We will pilot the effort in 19 secondary schools with our existing unarmed security vendors who have been trained, vetted, and approved by the board and who have worked with our school communities at sporting events and other large gatherings. Later this spring, we will partner with additional contractors to provide roving coverage to the remaining secondary schools and elementary school uh, communities. The goal is to work with school teams to create the climate and conditions for success. Our student safety assistants will collaborate with school administration and safety managers to provide a visible, supportive, and responsive presence in school buildings. School teams will provide a daily schedule that includes ongoing communication and is tailored to school needs. In this way, we will collect data on the effort and inform plans for the fall. 
Next slide. BCPS is open. Weeks ago, we shared that BCPS schools are open to volunteers and community partners. We appreciate and are looking forward to your help in creating an additional positive adult presence in schools. It makes a difference to our students to see parents, community organizations, and business leaders invested in their success. The Office of Family and Community Engagement, along with school leaders, will be working to increase the visibility of tools and resources to enhance existing partnerships and build new ones. Community partnerships help to strengthen and transform the learning experience for students. Stay tuned for information about how you can get involved as well as details for an upcoming partnership fair. So thank you for that support. Next slide. Thank you. As we finalize details for our comprehensive plan to ensure safe and supportive environments for students, we are enhancing elements of our communication protocols related to bullying, harassment, and intimidation. The superintendent roof 5580 requires us to respond, investigate, and communicate results of bullying, harassment, and intimidation reports to all families in a timely manner. To ensure that all members of Team BCPS are familiar with the requirements, we will provide a refresher training to all staff, develop an enhanced compliance monitoring tool for school leadership, widely share the process with students and families, and increase form accessibility so that, that it can be easily located and submitted electronically. Next slide. We will launch a widespread information campaign to promote the use of Maryland Center for School Safety reporting tip line. Many of our, our student council, junior council students are involved at the state level with the Maryland Center for School Safety and have spearheaded the efforts to reframe, reframe, see something, say something. The campaign will include posters that will be widely available in schools, on buses and websites on how to text a tip. While we continue to encourage students to report safe, safety information to school-based staff, this resource allows for 24-7 anonymous reporting to our state partners. All reported information is shared with BCPS and investigated through the Department of School Safety and Schools. Our updated school safety website will also include links to the Maryland Youth Crisis Line and other resources to support students. We value our partnership with our, our school resource officer program. We are working with the Baltimore County Police to coordinate how safety assistance will interact with the Baltimore County Police Department, including the four roving SROs recently proposed by the county government. We are appreciative of this, of this support from our county executive. Additional strategies will include staff training in de-escalation, a revised bus infraction reporting process to ensure timely responses, more social emotional supports to schools, including additional school counselors and social workers, student focused and student initiated opportunities to connect and create a sense of belonging through orientation, advisory, mentorships and transition programs and ongoing dialogue with neighboring school systems and our school communities for problem solving and feedback. Detailed information about our response will be shared in a community update tomorrow. I want to close by thanking everyone for your commitment to BCPS and being a part of this year-long conversation in support of our schools. This year has been filled with perpetual change, and your input and feedback have been invaluable. We're all on the same team, and I look forward to working together to implement and refine our practices to meet the needs of our students. And we will continue to update the board, our community and team BCPS, during these changing times. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The next item on the agenda is the chair's report. And as Dr. Williams said, um, the board has also been looking at policy 5580 around bullying, harassment, and intimidation. At the latest PRC meeting, we reviewed MSDE's model policy to address bullying, harassment, and intimidation. And that model policy states that all students have the right to be free from bullying, harassment, or intimidation. The Maryland State Department of Education is committed to providing a safe, productive, and inclusive learning environment. Bullying problems are symptomatic of relationship problems best addressed holistically by students, schools, 
parents and caregivers, and the entire community. Maryland schools should be places where students are surrounded by caring adults who encourage students to treat others with kindness and empathy while helping to build a relationship-focused, welcoming, supportive school environment, fostering academic and personal growth for every student. So I've been reflecting on this statement, and it raises some questions. If we are to offer these protections for students, shouldn't we also offer the same protection for our employees as well? Shouldn't employees also have the right to be free from bullying, harassment, or intimidation in the workplace? How can we ask our employees to provide a safe, productive, and inclusive learning environment if they do not feel safe? If adult bullying problems are allowed to persist, what example does this set for students, and what impact does this have on student bullying problems? How can we expect adults who are bullied at work to care for students who are bullied? If schools should be places where students are surrounded by caring adults who encourage students to treat others with kindness and empathy, shouldn't adults be expected to treat one another with kindness and empathy? How can we foster a relationship-focused, welcoming school environment when adults are permitted to bully, harass, and intimidate other adults? Other jurisdictions have implemented workplace bullying policies, and I've asked our policy review committee to consider adopting a similar policy as well, and strongly request that we recommend adopting one within Baltimore County Public Schools to further the objective of policy 5580 and set the example for our students as adults to treat one another with the same kindness and respect that we expect them to show. To do so, we have to take care of ourselves first, um, in order to take care of others. And that said, I hope that everyone takes care of themselves over the spring break that's coming up. Please take the time to rest, relax, rejuvenate, and come back fully recharged. I appreciate all, everyone's hard work and enjoy a wonderful spring break. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the student member of the board report. Thank you, Ms. Fenn, and good evening, everyone. I spent the past weekend at the National School Board Association Conference, which was an incredible opportunity to hear from our educational leaders across the nation about best practices, best performance, and how we can make our board more productive. I can say I especially appreciated meeting with student member of the boards across the nation, getting to collaborate and hearing the stories that they have to share from their board meetings. Tonight, I plan to introduce an environmental sustainability resolution. However, I'm planning to hold it off for just a few more meetings to get some final touches and to make it as robust as it can be. And so with that, in these next few weeks, I'm excited to continue visiting schools around the county. I'm excited for my final SMOB Town Hall, which is this Thursday, where I'll talk to students about the end of this year, set the foundation for some of the goals that students might want to accomplish in the next year, and continue to collaborate with our student member of the board elect, Roa Hassan, to see how I can be a guide to her, although she really doesn't need it, and helping her to make the most of these next few months as she prepares to sit in this very seat. Lastly, I hope everyone has a fantastic spring break, and to our seniors, now that college applications and admissions are over, I just want to say that I am super proud of all of you, and I hope that you can take the spring break to rest before our time in BCPS comes to an end. Thank you all. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Bersades. Good evening, Ms. Hen. Nothing to report. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract rewards, and for that I call on Ms. Joes, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Chair Hen. Uh, good evening, members of the board. The board's Building and Contracts Committee met earlier this evening. Items L1 through L45 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve items L1 through L45? Madam Chair, I'd like to Buzzy. separate out contracts, please. Yes. Which ones would you like to separate? Uh, I'd like to separate out number two. Um, staff presented together at the buildings and contracts meeting, uh, contracts 5 through 26 that all relate to cohorts. So that would be helpful, I believe, to group those together. Um, then I would like to separate out um, 27 
and um, 32. And I and it would also be helpful to um, then do they had all of these uh, related to Pine Grove Middle School as a batch. And the Pine Grove are numbers 33 through 45? Yes. Are you asking to separate those as well? I believe they were, uh, well, I was there, so I don't believe. They were uh, done as a batch, I believe, but the chair of the committee can speak more clearly to that. Ms. Cozzi, could you clarify which you're asking to separate? For discussion, I'd like to separate, for discussion and voting separately, I would like to separate out number two, five through 26, and number 32, and number 27. What about, oh, and 27. So may I have a motion then to approve items one, three, four, 28 through 31? And are you 33 through 45? Or are you asking to separate those as well? And 33 through 45, Ms. Causey? I believe uh, the chair of the or staff may be better to answer that whether those would be grouped together or not. I'm, I'm asking if you want to separate those or if we can vote on those with the others. Um, no, if you would please separate them, yes. Okay. So board members, we are voting on items one, three, four, 28 through 31. So moved, Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Is, no second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? Ms. Scott? Yes, could I just repeat? We are voting on one, three, four, 28 through 31. One, is that correct? Three, four, 28 through 31. Thank you. Yes. That is it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Thomas. Sorry, never mind. Not for this portion. Thank you. Okay. Let me check the chat. I think we're good. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Um, we're now discussing item two. Ms. Causey, did you have questions regarding item two? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I did. Um, the, um, I, it's a very significant contract, and so I wanted to have staff for everyone here, because I know many board members cannot attend building contracts, nor do our community, um, to just quickly review that. And also to my question is, uh, relative to the trends of the recent years for special education, how significant in a help this will be to our students and families. Um, thank you for the uh, question. I'll start off and I've uh, brought along with me Ms. Webster who is our purchasing expert so she can certainly jump in if she has, if she has, if I miss anything or if I misstate anything, please correct me. Um, on the special education uh, non-public placements, my understanding is this is, first of all, we, we certainly is a significant commitment for um, BCPS, and the, but nothing has changed with, with what we're doing here 
uh, versus our, our past practice. All we're, all we're doing here is, is bringing forward the, the schools at which we can place students. And then the estimate, I, I believe it's for multiple years, it's for five, five years, so that's why it's, it's a very high number. Um, but this is just allowing us to utilize these schools uh, that will, will place students as per their IEP. Thank you. And the, um, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, the general contract recommendation form, it indicates the prior fiscal year's actual and then the current fiscal year budgeted. And then uh, the ongoing year is going to be increased over the current fiscal year budgeted of 55 million? Correct. Correct. Yeah, the prior year was 49.9, and the uh, current fiscal year is budgeted at 55.2 million. And then in the future years? Uh, future years, and this is the lifetime of the contract, um, it's 217.9 million. So that's a five year, that's a five year uh, period. Okay, thank you. And then specifically, how many additional school were included? I don't, I think, uh, I don't believe this includes any, it, it's, I don't know that we're gonna utilize all these schools. These just give us the ability to utilize those if, if uh, IEPs indicate that, that uh, particular placements are needed. Good afternoon, good evening. It is, these are all state approved schools by MSDE. So we're required to utilize those schools and those schools only that are state approved schools. There are approximately 63 that are actually on the list. Not all of them are special education schools. So we utilize 53 currently. It's not a matter of which are additional, but those that are state approved, those that are special education or provide special education services. And not all of them provide the same type of special education services. So so we utilize per student need and then the type of school that is appropriate for that student according to their needs and their IEP. Thank you. I really appreciate the work. Thank you. Oh. Ms. Mack? Yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Hen. Um, do we know how do our per pupil expenditures for non-public placements um, compare to other LEAs? I do not have a current um, view or schedule uh, compared to our uh, the jurisdictions that we compare ourselves to, the three highest or the largest, but I can absolutely do a review of what our local three largest sites that we compare ourselves to, typically Prince George, Montgomery, et cetera. So we can do that and supply that um, at the will of our superintendent. Um Thank you. And my second question is this. Um, I have spoken with parents who have the wherewithal financially, educationally, and professionally to secure non-public placements for their students. Um, what steps do we take to ensure that students who do not have someone with the financial, educational, professional background to go through the process, what steps are we taking to advocate for those students to have equitable access to non-public placements if those placements best meet their needs? So it is our obligation first and foremost as um, Baltimore County Public Schools in that public school setting is to provide the services of special education to our students. That is our first obligation by federal law and Comar regulations. So we would provide those the all of the services that are identified in their IEP to the maximum extent possible on that continuum that we offer in our school setting from the general education setting to the most restrictive environment that we offer on the continuum and that's our public separate day school setting. Should a student need something beyond that, then we go ahead and we seek those services in a non-public setting. Should a family member, should a family or through settlement or one of the other options, a non-public is chosen or selected, or it is um, from another option, a, a choice by 
through settlement, case settlement, or due process situation, then we seek that non-public setting. Sometimes a family may choose that as an option. It does not necessarily mean that Baltimore County Public Schools cannot offer the same education. So I want to make that kind of clear a little bit in there because that's a misunderstanding sometimes that we are unable to provide that service for that family. So for families that believe that they may, it's not a matter of whether or not they can afford it, because in our system, when a family or a service deems it, or an IEP team deems that non-public is something that is necessary for them, it's an IEP team choice, so not just a family being able to afford something or not afford the service. We are still required to provide that, and they can do so through the IEP team process. Thank you for that information. My question was not so much about being able to afford it, my, because I do understand that we're required to provide it, but my question is, you mentioned, you used the word family numerous times in your answer. I am talking about children who may not have family to advocate for them, children who are experiencing homelessness, children who are in foster care. Um, how are we meeting those students' needs? So at, as you know, you and I have um, kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, students in foster care, either with their foster family, guardian ad litem um, being one of them. We sometimes, students with foster care have an educational surrogate. So anyone that represents that child at the table, at the IEP team meeting, they will represent them and have the same educational decision-making um, ability by law, as well as every student has a case manager that is assigned to them and they are at the school site, and they should be seeking out their educational interest. That is that special educator assigned at every school as their case manager is developing that IEP in the student's best interest. So they will be looking at out for that student and representing them in, during the IEP process as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, so this, this contract stood out to me because I, I know that we've talked before about restructuring special education in our system, um, bringing on board new, new team members, um, and I thought the ultimate goal was to reduce our non um, public placements, that that was the goal. And with this contract, we're adding $60 million over five years. And I know that our special education needs are growing, but my, my hope would have been that this contract would have been lower than the prior five years, given the efforts that we have in place. So that it is a continued effort to decrease. It absolutely is, and that is ultimately our goal. That, of course, does not happen overnight, and that is a continuous change in process. We have to do two things. We have to first put out you know, some of the fires, processes, and procedures and do that immediately, and that's our immediate stop gap that we are putting into place to in that restructuring process. And it's not really restructuring, it's building. It's building up the department in processes, procedures, compliance, and um, building that process from the ground up, right? Uh, or facilitating and building a solid foundation and structure. Then it is the long-term sustainable practices that we need to put into place. Those long-term sustainable practices that we will put into place will begin, you will begin to see that return. And that has already happened and it's, it's, does, it may not sound like a lot to everyone, but I want to say it is a tremendous step because there are folks who believe that what, there's, there's a better place, right? And so what we're trying to do is show everyone that every one of our schools is a really good place to get an education and that we can service our students and take care of the students and meet their needs in special education. So in doing that, we have already, and our compliance office has already began the process of reviewing the students annually that have been out in the non-public situation, and we have brought back eight currently in the last 13 students that have been reviewed in annual IEP, 
eight are set to return, and just prior to that we had two. Now 10 does not sound like a lot, but when you attach 40,000, some students with 80,000 annually a year, it begins to add up if we're only looking, and I'm, I'm only saying this as it's cost related to this because we're talking, we're speaking numbers, right? But when I look at it, I look at it as those are our babies coming back to our, to our house, right? And we get to take back our students of students with disabilities and take care of them and educate them the way I know that we can do so. And so that's, you know, I look at it that way that we get to then take care of them annually, look at their needs and address their needs. So that's 10, and that's 10 in this time that we've put this process into place. 10 to me turns into 20, 20 turns into 30. Before you know it, that number begins to turn around. And that's, that is the number we control. The other part of this is the cost of the placement, which we don't control. So some of this is just a cost, a, a, a product of the cost of the placement. Um, I think our, our department is trying to work on the number of placements that we actually have. And it sounds like we're making And progress. unfortunately, annual, there is an increase, right? There's an increase in tuition, things like that. And so when we do ask for this increase, we are, you know, you have to estimate that 2% increase per year. So unfortunately, whatever the cost was last year, we're seeking that 2%. It, that's why it increased. It's not because we want to have additional students out of BCPS schools. It's because there is a cost increase with tuition. And unfortunately, you're going to see that on this particular contract. So I would very much like to have more than 10 back. And hopefully within the next couple of months or as each annual review occurs, we bring them back. Yeah, that's great. And then my next question was going to be, how often do children come back? So that you answered my, my next question already. So thank you for that. Um, and I guess this is a five-year contract. So I will revisit this, though, in general, you know, special education department presentations, I guess, because, you know, five years from now, who knows who will still be around. So, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion on item L2? Mr. McMillian? Mr. Causey was oh. first. Go ahead, Mr. McDonald. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming, and I know what assumptions point back to me at, uh, I'm assuming that some of these programs are day treatment and residential? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Thank you. And um, we, if you could um, talk about the process for the, just briefly for the students coming back, so that's with the IP team and with the parent input, Yes. Yes. And so in this transition process, um, of course, what we what we would like to do with every student that returns, um, it's not only the IEP process plans for that return. Every IEP team, the parent is a critical and required member, but a critical member to have that input, not only in developing the IEP process, but that planned transition back to um, whatever the identified school is, whether it's their home school, or if they need a, re a um, service delivery model that maybe you want to think of it as a step-down model. So if they were in the most restrictive setting and we want to transition them back and it's not directly into, say, a general education setting where it's highly unstructured in a sense to them from where they came from, then we want to look into something that is more, a slightly more restrictive and so that we want to transition transition them slowly into a model, then the parent has input on that. What are we looking at? What's the best environment for their student? And so, yes, we consider all of that as a critical partner in that development of that process. Absolutely. Great. Thank you for that. We know that it, for families as well, it's so much easier when the students are in the community. Um, and then as um, the situation progresses, they can have more interaction, less restrictive environments than if they are in a a specialized non non public we, placement. Absolutely. We always want to work remembering our students are gen ed students first. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, the last statement is um, with the um, COVID and the pandemic and the closing of, um, of um, so many things, um, what was the situation financially for our students who were not able to go in person or there were um, disruptions to what they otherwise might have received? And um, that's compensatory time. Mrs. services. That's time. Good. You can hand. Please feel free to answer. I didn't understand the question, so apologies. Can you repeat the question? 
Is, is the question related to this contract? Because otherwise we need to, to vote and move on. It's related to the contract in terms of the amount of money in this contract for compensatory services for students who were at some of these institutions that were not uh, possibly able to deliver uh, what the IEP required. This contract did not deal with compensatory services. Okay, thank you. Do I have a motion to approve item L1? So moved, Thomas. Or, I'm sorry, L2? So moved, Thomas. Thank you. Um, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have um, items L5 through L26. Any questions regarding these items? Ms. Hen? Um, Mrs. Causey asked for 27 to be um, separate. L5 through 26 are the cohorts. I asked that 10 be separated. Ms. Mack, we already approved 10. I did not get your comment on that. Or 10, I'm sorry, 10 is included in 5 through 26. You want it separate 10? I did, please. Okay. So the motion then will be to approve items L5 through L9 and L11 through L26. So moved, Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. No second is needed. Any discussion? Madam Chair. Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, I just wanted staff to take um, a minute and explain the um, cohorts. There's a lot of good news in this um, in terms of the additional types of certifications that are now available to teachers, but also in terms of the numbers, how many of our um, teachers and staff are going to be able to receive this uh, specific training. Uh, sure. Um, thank you for the question. And the uh, basically, the, what I can say about the cohorts is we bring these annually, um, and they are a good uh, business item for us because they basically allow us to, um, instead of our employees going out, getting finding professional development on their own, we we uh, kind of form towards what we need. So we, we bid out the, the, the types of, of services that we need. And um, so these are all things that are good for the school system, that are good for our employees. And, um, um, and again, this is something we bring annually. So I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Oh my goodness. Hello. <laughs> um, I need to turn it on. No, I think no, it's you're on. Good. It's on. Um, so good evening, everyone. We do reach out to our college and university partners and inform them of the needs of our employees, both from a hiring perspective and from a professional development and certification perspective, and we ask them to send us proposals. And so we get proposals from all the local colleges and universities, and our content office leaders review those and then make recommendations of the programs that they think are best designed to meet our recruitment and employee development needs. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, board members? Mr. McMillian? Good evening. I'm curious about the competition for these positions from our teaching staff. Uh, I noticed one in particular with, it was 15 slots. Are there a lot of competition for these positions? It depends on the individual cohort Part. and the teacher's interest in that cohort. Sometimes the cohorts do fill very quickly, quite honestly, especially the ones that have no out-of-pocket cost for our employees, which some of these do. Uh, but the good news is that some of those colleges are also able to offer those same programs at that same price, and the only difference is that the participants pay up front and then use their tuition reimbursement benefit, which all of our teachers have uh, through the negotiated agreement, and they're able to participate in the programs that way. So that's the way we extend our reach. And a, and a cohort that has, an, a, has 
a, a high number of applicants for those slots, whatever the slots are. Is there a, a detailed application process with interviews or whatever to select those? The colleges and universities make the admissions decisions according to their established criteria. So some of them do require interviews. For the most part, they're looking at transcripts, grade point averages, very occasionally test scores in order to select participants. Um, and all things being equal, they select on a first come, first serve basis. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. So these, this contract, these cohorts, um, they're not only BCPS teachers that are in these programs, or is it only BCPS teachers? It is only BCPS? Oh, that's incredible. Yes. Okay, and then if we weren't to have these cohorts, if these teachers were to have these, uh, ha uh, participate in these services on their own, they would get reimbursed for tuition, so we would end up still paying the same amount. Yes. Okay. The advantage of the cohorts is that it allows us to prioritize the kinds of programs that we need to meet the needs of our Well, this is excellent. Thank you so much. Certainly. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve item L10? So moved, Thomas. Thank you. No seconds needed. Any discussion? Ms. Mack? Yes, Ms. Hen. Mm hmm. Go ahead, Ms. Mack. Um, I'd like staff to provide some insights into why this contract, which is a literacy contract, is not with a school like Morgan, um, a school that is currently seeking um, International Dyslexia Association certification, or a school like McDaniel, which certifies educators um, in the Wilson Reading System, which for BCPS is a tier three um, reading intervention. So we have um, Debbie Piper who was speaking from the uh, teacher development portion of the Division of Organization Effectiveness. So thank you for joining us. And then we have Jennifer Kraft, the director of our English Language Arts. Um, so either one can respond. I can speak to the proposals that were received. Uh, we did not receive a proposal for a literacy program from Morgan State University. So we didn't have the opportunity to select that school um, to award the contract to. And one of the two literacy contracts uh, is recommended for McDaniel College. So teachers would have a choice Yes, there are two reading specialist programs recommended, one from McDaniel College and one from Towson University. Right, but the one, this number 10 is specifically for Towson, and my concern is that should we put our teachers, pay this money and put our teachers through this, we will then have to re-educate them on the science of reading because that is not part of Towson's curriculum. Go ahead, Ms. So I was able to actually um, talk with the um, program lead and um, look at the syllabi. And actually, three of their courses do go into um, looking at how students learn to read in terms of uh, the neurology. And so uh, there is a course on teaching reading theory and practice where they talk about the neuroscience of language and literacy, including the neurobiology of reading. Um, their reading assessment course um, discusses and investigates language-based and neurological-based deficits and how to properly instruct those based on the diagnosis from the assessment. And there's also a piece within their clinic internship in reading uh, where they um, do specific diagnostic work, including students that have deficits related to neurobiological-based issues, and they develop a plan to instruct based on student need. And so there's several courses where they do get into the neuroscience of how students learn to read. So is it your belief that a teacher who or an educator who comes out of this program will be proficient enough to really follow the science of reading, um, phonemic awareness, word morphology, all of that? 
I believe that, yes, that the, the way that the mm -hmm. syllabi is laid out, that they will uh, be able to come out and be uh, understand what is necessary for students. Uh, in this particular program, uh, they are also, it aligns really well with our Compass because there is also an ESOL certification. So what's really interesting as you start to talk about reading not only the neuroscience, but also understanding um, the different demands for English language learners and how um, language was acquired when it's a second language. And so I think that this program actually um, addresses not only what we know about the um, how students need to learn to read and what we know about the brain science, but it also addresses a changing population and elevates part of our compass. Thank you. I have a quick follow-up question about Morgan. Okay. Ms. Mack, is, if, is that related to this contract? Otherwise, I would ask you to, to hold it and possibly okay, email it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions regarding L10? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Hen? No. What was the final count? Favor is seven. The motion carries. Okay. Next we have, um, let's see. Thank you. Item L27. May I have a motion to approve item L27? So moved, Thomas. Thank you. No seconds needed. Any discussion? Mrs. Causey? Mrs. Causey? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this, in building and contracts, a question was asked about um, we, the board had earlier passed a contract or we don't, pa we don't pass the contracts because we don't see those. The general contract recommendation form um, that, that one had already been passed. And if you could just explain a little more that that this why this is separate yeah so <clears throat> the intent of this uh, request here is to separate the finance portion of purchase so let's take for example the panel purchase uh, the clary panels uh, this would allow us this is a, a cooperative contract so we're using pre-competed um, or responsive bidders for this particular contract to allow us to s separate the finance uh, payments and charges from the actual purchase of the equipment. Um, and in cases, since we do have multiple bidders, it allows us to get a, a better price for the financing charges of the equipment that we're looking at. Okay, thank you. And so would it make sense that the other contract authority would be reduced by a million and a half since it was the board's understanding that that contract included uh, pricing whether some and it was a very large contract mm -hmm. and it was very complicated it had some statements as to some things would be purchased and some things would be leased so uh, one would believe that that included the leasing fees which uh, contract was that Ms. Kazi well there were two very large ones that I abstained from because I felt it was important for the board to understand the overall technology plan. Um, I'm sure staff can identify them. So you have my understanding is financing was not part of those right. of those contracts. Financing was separate separated out because we knew we were going to take this uh, this approach of separating financing from the actual um, the actual items. And and again the the as Mr. Augusta uh, said. Um, the reason we do that is because when we're when we're going for a vendor, they may have the best, um, I, the, the best, uh, uh, say, laptop, but their financing may not be favorable. So we split that out so we can get the the type of equipment we want, but we can also then also, also get the best financing um, available to us. So that's why we split this out. And gentlemen, is it safe to say we're not going to incur the financing costs twice? Correct. Even yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Well, Okay, I think it would be helpful for me as a board member personally to, and that's why those large contracts Ms. are. Mrs. Causey, is, do you have any other questions specific to this contract? I think it would be helpful for the board to know ultimately what 
equipment is going to be purchased and what is going to be leased and why that, that is that's the most not relevant point of order no. Ms. That, that's not relevant to this contract which is just on financing so if you have any other questions specific to this financing contract i'll entertain them otherwise that's not germane to this contract miss miss point, point of order point of order thank you that's what is your um, point of order Yes, my point of order is that we're moving away from discussing the contracts, Ian. Um, there was a committee meeting. I understand where this could have been asked, so. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. Thank you. The point is whether this amount is the appropriate amount. And if the board doesn't know what level of equipment is being purchased or leased, how can the board make the right decision about whether this is the correct amount, $1,500,000? to be on this contract. So that's the nature of my question. Sure. The, the 1.5 million that you see here is actually an estimate based on um, <clears throat> the expenditures purchases that we do intend for um, the upcoming uh, year. So that would include a, um, the anticipated uh, purchases of Chromebooks, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, expected purchases or, or sorry, um, the financing associated with Chromebooks and then also with the panel. So we, the 1.5 is a number that's come up and it's based on proposed expenditure for the upcoming year. So we didn't just pull that number out. It is, there's some basis to it. I think it would still be helpful for the board to receive re reports on what is purchased and what is leased. Thanks. Thank you. And, and that level of detail would be helpful on the contract award um, document we receive in the future. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, board members? Ms. Han. Yes, <clears throat> Mr. Kuhn. Mr. Kuhn. Hi, thank you. Um, so we talked about this allowing us or providing some kind of flexibility associated with financing. And I was hoping that staff could just to illustrate how this is going to affect our ability to um, to go ahead with some of these large contracts that we have that Ms. Causey was talking about and that we've passed or at least we've we've approved the spending for significant spends on hardware that we need uh, for um, for the system. So. Could you just illustrate how this contract helps us or this money allows us to finance these things in a way that we are actually saving money? Yeah, I can do the first. So here's an example, and I'll, I'll actually caveat this. So I'm going to give you some fake numbers here, but here's is for, just to illustrate how this would work. Um, the existing financing vendor that we use, I believe it's Dell or... HP, thank you. HP financing. Um, we're going to get a certain rate from them for the financing charges. Um, with this particular contract here, since we're using a cooperative contract with bidders, um, we do have three uh, additional vendors here. Uh, they can, if they offer us a um, finance rate that say it's one percent less than what we're looking at from. Um, HP financial that there's this there's the savings there before this contract we'd be limited to the one sole provider that we have just and just to piggyback on that the three companies are EMC corporation Dell EMC uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise Company and Presidio Network Solutions. So, so that is the key, the key point. Is is when we uh, if we just go through the the vendor that we we purchase the the hardware with, we get whatever financing agreement they they give us. This allows us to go out and pick the the best of the of the three for each group. Each time we go out and procure equipment, we can we can uh, get the best financing available. Okay, just to follow on. One of my, so we've provided a significant amount of money. And when I think about financing, I'm thinking about the leasing agreements that we're entering, but we also have purchase agreements. And when we're purchasing things, we're purchasing them outright, correct? Or are you borrowing money and financing the purchase over a number of years? We we have, uh, we have I believe, historically been financing our, 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 uh, um, technology spend 
Um, we've been doing that for a number of years. So yes, we in effect we are paying for the the uh, the equipment over I believe five years is 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 how we go about it. And, that's, right, well, and that is not a new. That's a that's an existing practice. It's been going on for many, many years. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think um, you know I, I don't want to get into it here. Perhaps we can talk about this in the budget uh, committee meeting or further in in uh, some kind of committee meeting, uh, so that it's it's clear as to what these uh, charges we're incurring and, and what the expenses are. So if this money makes it possible for us to get lower rates, I'm, not, I'm more than happy to, to approve it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. And, and I'll second that. I, I appreciate the fact that we're shopping around mm -hmm. for the best rates and that we are able to separate the financing from the purchase so or the leasing, whatever. So I, I applaud that. I think this shows initiative and that is something that I've been looking for a long time. So I truly appreciate this and thank you for bringing it to us. Thank you. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? We have them. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Brings us to L32. Do I have a motion to approve item L32? So moved, Thomas. Thank you. Um, May I, any discussion? Question, Kuhn. Mr. Kuhn? Thank you. We, we, we discussed this uh, at length in the budget committee meeting, and I just had one question. Uh, hopefully, Mr. Dixit or someone can address this. Um, my understanding is this is being funded by a grant, I believe, from at, at the state level that was provided by um, a specific politician. And I'm just curious as to who that person was. So good evening. This, these grants are quite common that are provided by the help of elected officials at the state level. Uh, they try to take care of schools uh, or needs in their schools. Uh, I don't keep track of the name of the elected official, but this was provided. There were two separate grants that included uh, turf field and uh, associated work. There was some money left over from that grant we used to fund this project. And if there was any additional money needed, uh, we work with the county to get the money from uh, local capital program, which is what our practice is. We always try to do work that is needed at any school. And uh, uh, if the grant needs some kind of support, we try to help if the money is available. And that's what has happened. So it's not anything unusual. Right. Mr. Dixit, I fully understand that. Um, having been involved in the Towson High School boosters, I know that um, uh, delegates and electeds are always trying to provide uh, money for facilities and help with things like um, 
uh, fields and, and and what have you. So, I was just trying to clarify for the public uh, who supported it um, because I think it's great that Pikesville is getting a new track, and um, you know maybe you don't know on the top of your head and that's fine. Where can someone go to find that information? Could you just direct you know help us direct the public where to go? So uh, we can direct the public to contact their. Uh, state representatives because these grants they do come from state um, and, and if there is anybody who's interested in we can help them uh, in a lot of cases state delegates they ask for our help and if there's anything we can do to support our schools and our students we always do that but there are specific grants that we're using. So I just, I, I'm curious and I'm just trying to understand where the money called, came from so people understand where that money came from so these and grants who made are, it available. These grants are initiated by the state legislatures and they work through the Department of General Services. So it's it's not any secret amount of money. It's mm. it's, it's well known fact. And we have several projects going on um, in county now and in the past. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Um, yes, and this may have been discussed in building and contracts. If it was, I apologize. But uh, Mr. Dixit, do we have a process for listing and prioritizing needs like this for all of our schools, similar to like the construction plan? So for certain building systemic projects, we try to maintain a list based on the knowledge of the condition and based on the age of equipment, but not for each and every systemic project. Um, I, I'm, I'm speaking specifically to like tracks and turf and things like that. So I don't know if I made myself clear. Okay, so that helps me. Uh, a lot of our effort in the past, as you know, has been in the area of providing seats, air conditioning, and those systemics that directly impact classroom environment, like uh, heating or roof leaks. As a result of that, as a result of those competing priorities, a lot of site work, hard surface work, tracks, uh, we had not had were able to find funding for those type of projects. And I'm glad to share that because of the effort made by the superintendent uh, and his team, uh, we are trying to work out to get some additional funding in the next couple of years for the track and for the uh, site work. So, Ms. Mack, do you have any um, specific questions to this contract? Um, no, I'll hold, no, no. Thank you. Um, Ms. Causey and then Ms. Joes. Thank you. So my understanding from attending the board uh, building and contracts committee is that the Pikesville track, um, if you can confirm, was last resurfaced in 2005? That's correct. Okay, and so to follow along other board members' conversations, and again, number one, we appreciate the support of our elected officials in providing funding in all of the manners that they do it um, with the state budget, the county council uh, budget, the county budget, um, and then these uh, special grants. Um, and so my understanding is that Hereford High School's track is from 1995, and it was asked earlier if there is a life um, cycle of tracks. Um, so can you confirm is there a list with the age of the tracks? Um, in, and then what is it? Like we know roofs last a certain time. So there is no definite certain amount of years, um, but uh, a good estimate is 15 to 20 years. And during that time, tracks do need repair. And uh, if there are any requests for repair, we take care of that. Specifically talking about Hereford, the effort that I mentioned earlier about trying to get additional funding, Hereford is one of the uh, high schools which is included in those efforts. 
Well, I appreciate that response because I can imagine, as with all of our facilities, when they have high use, um, as some of our overcrowded schools okay. do, that they may need to be replaced or uh, sooner than other things. So I appreciate your comment and that um, everyone is looking at all of the needs of the county. Thank you. Ms. Joes. Thank you. I, I just want to clarify that this is a grant, and I saw a lot of questions related to politicians and grants, and, and clearly everybody knows who the politician is. I don't. Uh, ask the politician if you want to figure out how a grant is done, and wear and tear of tracks is based on usage. It's based on how often it's maintained, and if you're just going to look at how often it's replaced, we should also look at how much maintenance money is put in every year in some of these tracks. So that, that will be a much more valid way of looking at it, how much money is put in every year into some of these tracks. Um, that's all I have to say, and, and thank you. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Co Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve items L33 through L45? So move, Thomas. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Recuse. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the proposed board meeting schedule for 2022 to 2023. May I have a motion to approve the proposed board meeting schedule for 2022 through 2023 as presented in Exhibit M? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Do I have a second? Second, second Mack. Off. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Any discussion? Met Mr. Thomas? Thank you. I just wanted to state, um, this is after my term, but I'm wondering if this board wants to consider additional meetings um, since the term of many board members will be ending uh, at that moment. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I'm going to be abstaining from this vote because I won't be on the board at the time. Thank you. Okay. So I'll, I'll respond to, to that, Mr. Thomas, and thank you for the suggestion. So the board chair always has the ability to call special meetings, um, either independently or at the request of board members. So even though those, or if those aren't added to the calendar um, or scheduled, those, that's always an option, even if we don't do so now. So thank you for that suggestion. Thank you. Ms. Joes, did you have a No, thank you, Ms. Henry. You answered my question. This schedule is put together pursuant to our board policy 8311, which every board has to do, even if we're not on the board. Thank you. Okay. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Rao? He said yes. She said yes. Oh, sorry. Ms. Kazi? I'm sorry? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Abstain. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the FY 2022 budget appropriation transfer. And for that, I call on Mr. Hartlove and Mr. Tantliff. Hello. Good evening. Um, we're going to uh, step you through the uh, the uh, the bat for uh, this year, and I'm going to uh, uh, turn it over to Mr. Tantliff, our Director of Budget and Management. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Mr. Tantliff. Good evening. Good evening. 
Uh, <clears throat> good evening. In front of you, you'll find a budget appropriation transfer request. The BCPS budget consists of 13 separate appropriations by activities prescribed by the Maryland Department of Education. Transfers of fund between activities requires approval from the Board of Ed and the County Council. Based on close monitoring of expenditures through the first three quarters of FY22, our current full year expense projections show an overall surplus, but with shortfalls in some activities and surpluses in others. Because BCPS carries no contingency budget, the only way to manage unanticipated expenses during the year is via amendments to the budget. We are projecting that overall we'll finish the year approximately $45 million under budget. Uh, that's before $21 million in new BAT items uh, that you have before you. Uh, each quarter, all budget line transfers that make up this BAT were reviewed with the Budget Committee to address concerns raised in the efficiency study. Additionally, the BAT contains several new requests that are contingent on board BAT approval to make funds available for these purchases. Included is $11.7 million in technology-related items, $9.6 million in textbooks, and $475,000 for HVAC service contracts. The details can be found in the materials submitted to the board for this meeting. In the BAT, available funds of $12.6 million are coming from Activity 3, instructional salaries due to salary savings from vacancies and a challenging hiring environment. $6 million can be transferred from Activity 6, special education due to position vacancies. $5.5 million is coming from Activity 9, student transportation which will reallocate salary savings from vacancies, and $8.7 million is available to be transferred from Activity 12, fixed charges due to fringe benefits associated with vacancies. A transfer of $10.6 million into Activity 1 administration will provide funds for board legal fees, which were originally unbudgeted, uh, and the following year-end requests, prepayment of technology equipment financing for the BCPS firewall of $4.5 million, high school network and uh, voiceover IP upgrades, $1.5 million, prepaid, prepayment of software license fees, $4.5 million, technology for food services of $767,000, technology for transportation of $12,000, and technology for facilities of 486,000, offset by salaries and savings of 1.3 million. Lastly, request a transfer of 15.7 million into Activity 4 instructional textbooks and supplies. We'll provide funds for the purchase of FY23 textbooks, 9.6 million, and digital content of 1.4 million. The purchase of digital display boards for classrooms of 3 million. And it also will cover principal's reallocation of their per pupil operating funds during the year of 1.8 million. A transfer of 6.6 .6 million to activity 11, maintenance of plant, will provide funds for maintenance service contracts, 4.9 million, emergency chiller replacement at Deer Park Middle School of 806,000, and bottled water in schools of 900,000. I do want to mention again that uh, everything other than the two new requests have been reviewed each quarter by the Budget Committee in detail. So um, it's just uh, the sum of those budget line transfers throughout the year built the basis for the budget appropriation transfer, and that was a new process we put in place this year. With, with, um that and on that uh, on that note, um, in just talking about some of the changes from this year to last year, uh, Witt talked about the budget line item transfers that are going on going over at the uh, budget committee meetings quarterly. The other item is uh, a schedule that's included in your packet that is new. I don't know if you want to just uh, briefly go over that as well, uh, just in a in an effort to be as transparent as we possibly can. Uh, sure. So the uh, as mentioned, there were two. Uh, packets of items that uh, have not been purchased yet or and are contingent on the board approving the budget appropriation transfer for technology and textbooks. And we gave you a detailed handout that shows you all the line items that comprise um, that $20 million plus request. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, we'll now be happy to take any questions. Sure. So I have one to, to start us off. Um, should we be expecting another bat request before the end of this fiscal year in addition to this? No, this is the only uh, bat that we'll request this fiscal year. This uses full year projections and um, any request the superintendent wanted to bring forward to fund this year. Okay, so nothing is pending beyond you know, what we have here. No, this will cover everything we'd like to do this year. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Um, yes, um, Mr. Tantliff, first of all, thank you very much. I learned a lot from the presentations that um, you have made throughout the year at the Budget Committee. And my question is a specific question, but it could be a more general question. Um, the item the, requested on the first line of subtotal activity 004, instructional textbooks and supplies, is $7.9 million for a specific literacy program for which a pilot started just yesterday. So my question is a process question. If the pilot is not successful and another product is ultimately purchased, what are the implications from a financial slash accounting standpoint? Uh, well, if this moved forward as requested, those materials would be uh, a purchase order would be put in place for the full almost $8 million purchase. If, if the pilot is not successful? Um, Dr. Boswell McComas would need to uh, comment on the pilot. Ms. Shea, um, would you respond to or that Ms. question? Shea. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so thank you for the question. Of course, if the pilot were not successful, we would not move forward with purchasing those materials. So um, Mr. Tantliff, um, I think the question is what happens to that uh, $7.9 million if we don't. And I just want to offer that there are two more gatekeeping moments, as you see reflected in the bat, that we would still be bringing forward the contract for these materials to the June Contracts Committee, which would be another opportunity. So if we were to approve the funds in the bat, we finish the pilot, my hope is we come to Curriculum Committee in May and the Contract Committee in June, and everything is perfect. If that is not the case and the pilot is not successful, I think the question is, we're not going to spend the $7.9 million on a product that was not successful. What would we do with those funds? Um, at that point, the funds would just go into fund balance. They would be unspent. Right. And I, and I think uh, uh, that's a good point that Ms. Shea made before. Everything that we spend, there's two main steps in us spending dollars. One is to have the uh, appropriation, the budget in the right place. That's what you're seeing here tonight. The other item is a contract, which we bring to you. So there's there's usually typically two steps that we bring. We we don't we do not procure anything without going through both of those steps. So this is a step that puts the dollars in place. I believe it was the May or June uh, meetings where we're going to bring back the contract. And if the uh, pilot does not go for, if the pilot is not successful, um, even if we had both steps, we, we, we wouldn't, we would not procure at that point. Um, Ms. Hen, may I speak, um, add to that? That that was never my question. I, I know that we would not move forward. My question is truly a process question. I think um, Mr. Tantliff said it, it would go back into the fund, but it, would it go back to the county or would, would it be able to be used at some point in the future for another program? Um, at year end, any unspent general funds go into uh, fund balance. Uh, the county, you can think of it as them holding those funds for us. And we've uh, almost every year in history reappropriated some of those funds, so it's been almost 32 million the last several years. The county could ask us to appropriate more of those funds if they chose to. But um, the best way to think about it, Ms. Mack, is that money is sort of sitting in the bank, um, and at some point we can appropriate those funds. But we could not use them in the current year. We would need to actually add them to the budget and use them as a source of funding in a future year. Yeah, and so but we wouldn't lose them. No. Right, it's BCP Thank you very BCPS much, fund you. Thank balance. Thank you for answering. I'm oh. sorry, I, overspoke, I spoke over you. Yeah, it was BCPS fund balance is what I wanted to uh, make sure that we clarified. 
I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I, I, when we were talking about fund balance and you were talking about reverting to the county, I wanted to make sure that we understood that it was BCPS fund balance. So it's our fund balance. Where it would thank you. It thank would you very to. much. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, yes. Uh, thank you for the handouts and for the presentation. I thought you explained things really well, and I appreciate that. Um, my two specific questions were about the spending money on digital displays and the cafeteria point of service technology, just because I thought we had already approved contracts for those things. So is this more of those or enhanced um, versions? Or <laughs> sure. Uh, so the contract covers multiple years of purchasing, but we need to have uh, the money available to spend. So we're, uh, because we are underspending this year, we're requesting to purchase more of those displays this year to free up the funds in future years. It's all within the contract authority that the board approved. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Um, can you explain to me how it is that we have continuous year after year needs in transportation and special education and yet it seems many of these bad transfers we seem to have money to transfer out of those two departments uh, Ms. Rowe would you mind uh, just saying that again please it was a little muffled yeah. Could so you we have year that? after year uh, continuing needs in transportation and special education how is it that we have money to transfer out of those two departments? Um, we uh, fully intend to expend both of those budgets. Um, and in some years, we actually do overspend uh, special ed. But because of the difficulties we have in hiring um, employees generally, that's causing us to underspend the budget. I think that's the very simple explanation. To the best of our ability, we are, HR is all going all out to try to hire in those um, categories. And in particular this year, our, our vacancies are significantly higher than they've been in past years. Um, but in general, those are hard to hire areas. Is there nothing that special ed needs besides um, those positions? I think HR is trying to fill every position they can. I guess my concern is moving money out of categories like transportation and special ed. I can't imagine that we can't find some way to spend that money within those categories. Uh, we don't have any way in the next two months to effectively spend money in those categories where the dollars are targeted towards positions. We can only spend on positions we have for transportation. Um, as you know, we significantly use contract routes in addition to our drivers. Um, and we're fully utilizing uh, them. We want to smartly spend our money. But just based on our current uh, run rate, this is our projected year-end surplus. It is not through lack of trying to fill all of these positions. Um, did you just say that we could only use money that's FTE allocations for other FTEs? I'm, I'm sorry. Could you clarify that? Say it you again, seem please. To, you seem to indicate that if money is surplus because it's a position or an FTE, that we can only spend that money on some other position or FTE. Is that what you meant to say? No, no that was just from a practical standpoint what's actually happening i mean in transportation you you can find a driver or a contract route we've gone year to date with uh, vacancies that have created the surplus so i'm not sure how we could effectively uh spend that money in the last two months of the year right and those those three areas that we've moved the dollars out of are very labor intensive areas instruction special education and transportation so that's where most of the spending is occurring one one people so when we can't find the people there's not a lot of other things to use those dollars for in those areas um, and our biggest effort is finding people or finding substitutes or finding contractual people but we make our, our efforts are to utilize the dollars in the categories they're in but then when we get to the year end and we project that we won't be spending all of those dollars we look for opportunities across the system um, and that's what we've identified and that's why we're moving some of the dollars around 
Okay. And my last question is for um, the chair of the budget committee. Did the budget committee have a recommendation on this bat transfer? Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Rowe, we've, we've discussed in detail the line items that have been provided um, within various transfers. Um, we never took any action to approve or disapprove anything. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have a follow-up to Ms. Rowe's question and then Mr. Thomas, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, with regards specifically to transportation, um, does that mean, I know we can't fill those positions, you said that, but we also can't pick up additional contract routes? Is that what I heard you say in terms of spending? Well, I believe they're fully utilizing contract routes to the best of their ability. So we're not restricting transportation's ability to use contract routes. This is just based on the forecast of how many they're using, how many they're projecting to use, how many vacancies we have, covering vacancies with other positions which cause, uh, you know, overtime pay or, um, you know, just other ways of covering those positions. So I, I believe transportation is doing the best they can with every resource at their disposal. So, and, and I know you may not be able to speak to this then, but are the, what are the restrictions then in terms of not being able to use additional contractors to cover these routes that we can't get drivers to cover? Uh, I don't believe there are any particular restrictions other than resources from the bus um, from the bus companies themselves. Literally the availability. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Can you repeat again how much of the budget that was underused? Uh, it'll be about $45 million this year, pending the $21 million of new spending uh, we're requesting the board approve in the BAT of the current year budget. Okay, so then it would be $24 million overall if the BAT is approved that would go unspent? Yes. Okay, and that unspent money, is that going into the BCBS fund balance as well? Yes. So we will be able to have that money in the future? Yes. Okay. Um, does the county executive and the county council also to have, have to approve these BATs? Yes. We'll go present to, um, well, the county council will is the only one that votes on it, but we present to his staff first. Okay, thank you. And this question, I, I'm not sure if we would answer, but for the transportation um, BAT, you know, for this surplus of, of money, is it not possible to temporarily increase the wages of, bus, of the bus drivers we have or to provide additional bonuses for our transportation services? Well, I think we've done a lot of work on that this year. All drivers and bus attendants are getting an extra $2 an hour for the year. And there's, you know, been a lot of work looking at the AFSCME contract for next year, different colas, different restructurings. Um, but uh, there's also a number of bonuses that have been offered throughout the year for hiring and retention, et cetera. Okay, but that was a, a possibility of discussion for these bats as well? Um, I, I, I can't uh, okay. speak to that. It would be at the superintendent and board's discretion if they chose to propose some other type of compensation this year. Okay, well, thank you. Those are my questions, and thank you for thank those you. excellent answers. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Sorry, my question was asked, but I, I do have a follow-up question. In one of your line items, you have, um, sorry, your equipment finance, financing agreement payoff for high school network and VOIP upgrades. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your savings by doing the early payoff, your useful life has seven to 10 years. And does that affect your uh, maintenance and service agreements for those? So uh, for the um, equipment finance for the VOP upgrades, the early payoff is, um, I believe it's about a $90,000 savings that we have um, and in terms of support um, the the contract goes through so included in the VOIP upgrades is also um, this also it includes the support services in that so paying it off early is not going to affect our support um, 
for the ongoing support for the life of that of those uh, devices. All right, thank you. And so the ninety thousand includes the firewall and the high school um, network upgrades. This is for yes. This is for high school uh, network and the voice over IP upgrades. The firewall. So she's correct. Okay. Okay. You're correct. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. <clears throat> Thank you. So the monies that we're talking about are not any of the federal funds related to CARES Act. No, this is only the general fund we're discussing tonight, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify that for the public. Thank you. Um, and I do appreciate the additional discussions in budget committee and and the additional information that you all have presented here tonight. It's a, it's a much needed increase of transparency. Um, so I have a question related to the Board of Education's budget. Um, Dr. Williams is the treasurer of the Board of Education. Is the 87,000 that's included in this request of 10,550,000, uh, excuse me, 10, yeah, 10,550,000. ,000. Administrative transfer category one, is that sufficient to cover known and projected deficits in the board's uh, budget? And does this amount include any additional for the public works recommendations? One, um, there's, I guess, 10 of them, uh, 17 through 114, and then 110 and 111 as well. And any um, unexpected expenses? Well, as the staff reported, the $87,000 is uh, to provide fun funds for the board legal services, which were unbudgeted for this year. So that's the best estimate based on the fees thus far and to wrap out the remaining of the year. Thank you. However, the public works recommendations also um, suggest uh, multiple inputs from the Maryland Association Boards of Education, multiple activities for the board to prepare. The board has no additional staff with which to fulfill these, uh, but there are tier one recommendations, which uh, the implementation suggestion was November of 2022. So, so those so recommendations were a part of our proposed budget that uh, went forward to the county executive. When you're talking about positions, this board added positions, um, we're talking about the current year. And so as it was indicated by staff, we did an estimate of the board legal fees to finish out the rest of this year. So the recommendations is my understanding that the board will be briefed at some point about the status of the recommendations affiliated with the public works, chapter one. Thank you, and part of that will require input from others. So. Uh, well, that's the work of the board, and I know um, the last report, uh, I believe uh, Chairwoman Hinn gave a brief update about those recommendations, and I'm sure they will be forthcoming before the year is over. Okay, other quick question is, uh, were our advisory councils uh, g provided input, Special Education Citizen Advisory Council, Gifted and Talented Citizen Advisory Council, or the uh, master, um, our bargaining unit leadership? You on, on, on what, Ms. Causey? The budget allocation transfer They provide input and updates for the budget process, not the budget, not the BAT. Right, because the BAT is typically, what we're doing with the BAT is just to try to cure any kind of uh, deficit areas and take advantage of typically not positions, but, but um, areas of need that we weren't able to fund. Um, so that's what a lot of these items are things that, um, you know, we have an opportunity to take advantage of. Um, and uh, time is of the essence, you know, we're, we're close to the end of the year, so we want to uh, take advantage of that. But if I may there are things add, that have been vetted. Yeah, I think if I may add, I think the best example last year was you're trying to balance your checkbook, right? So at some point you may end up moving funds and so I remember last year the same question came up and the staff gave that example as to the whole purpose of a bat. Right. And if I may comment on that, Mrs. Causey, if you don't mind. I'll reserve my time, thank you. Okay. 
Um, one of the things that the board has asked for at the beginning of the budget cycle is that list, that wish list of things that aren't included in the budget when we get it at the beginning of the cycle so that we could consider it in our request to say, okay, this might not make the cut, but do we feel as a board that this should be in the initial pass? And that is something and that I will bring to the Budget Committee for consideration as we discuss our processes moving forward because we would like to be a part of that um, department input process that when departments make their requests, we don't want to just hear what they requested from year to year and are interested. We're not interested in the status quo. We want to hear the wish lists as well because we're interested in transformational change for our school system and doing what we've done year after year is not gonna bring about that change. That's what we're talking about. So when I hear you say this is, this is opportunity, that excites me, these types of things. Like we have additional resources to apply to that. I'd like to flip that, that scenario, so that the board can say, okay, we are going to ask for what our students need. We're doing that on the capital budget now and we're, sh we're shooting higher than we have in the past. We need to do that on the operating side as well. Yes. Um, Ms. Scott, I want to acknowledge you, and I believe you, I want to make sure you're next. Mr. Kuhn was next, and then Ms. Scott. Mr. Kuhn? Thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, Mr. Tantliff, Mr. Hartliff, thank you for all this detail. Sorry. Really appreciate it. Uh, the time that you spend in the committee <clears throat> educating uh, board members and the public that wants to join uh, is truly very, very useful and insightful. Um, I did want to follow up specifically on one item here. We're talking about the nearly $8 million uh, transfer for the My Literacy, I'm sorry, the My View Literacy um, program. And Ms. Shea had said that there's a pilot, my understanding is there's a pilot undergoing, happening right now, and that a contract or a request will come in June. And I know that our fiscal year ends at the end of June. And my concern is that there's very limited time between now and June, and this is really a process question. If indeed we're unable to approve or move forward on that specific um, contract in June, can we push the money into 23 and do we still have access to it? I, I think the um, the only opportunity you have, if you needed a little more time, you could encumber the money, but not execute the purchase order. So that would hold the money. Um, so you, but you wouldn't release the order to the vendor. But you couldn't do that for very long without violating accounting rules. But you know, if it was a small amount of time. Um, you know, discussions between Mr. Hartlove and the controller might allow that. But if it's months, I don't, I don't think we could do that. And, and if it's not approved and we don't we run out of time, in essence, the money just reverts back to the county, correct? Correct. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Uh, it's just really fast. I just wanted to follow up on something that Ms. Hen said. So a lot of the things in this list are they're not necessarily wish list items. They're getting a jump start on contracts that we already had planned for, but now we'll we'll get a head start essentially. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure I heard correctly. Um, you said there were is nine hundred thousand in bottled water. Is that correct? Yes, consistent with the last five or six years. And that was going to be my second question, if it was the same, if it had increased or decreased. Um, uh, it might be a little more, but I mean, order of magnitude, it's similar. Similar? Okay, because I was wondering if that had anything to do with um, faucets that had um, lead in them and um, if that was why there was the need for bottled water, because my understanding was that those faucets were replaced and repaired um, and it's, I, I believe it's also up on the um, BCPS website. So is that in the bottled water? Is it in response to those um, faucets that have led? Uh, I, I might be speaking a little out of turn, but we've put bottled water in most schools and we've left them there, I believe. Okay, so it's nothing to do with the faucets or their status. Well, it probably did originally when 
there were some uh, concerns coming up. Mm -hmm. I think we started putting bottled water, depending on the age of the school and the piping, if it was, I, I forget the initial year, if it was earlier than a certain year. And then I think it expanded from there to be extra cautious. Okay. But someone in facilities would need to verify Probably Mr. exactly Dixon where or they're something. sitting. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know if he's that. available to verify that. If yes, not, I can. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, oh, yes. hello. <laughs> hello, how are you? So, um, Mr. Tancliffe is absolutely right that it has nothing to do with the testing of water, that this, this is just expenses on bottled water. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Mm -hmm. And just as a follow-up, Mr. Dixit, if we've changed the faucets and we've tested for water, why are we still getting that much um, dollar amount for bottled water? Is this an optics thing that kids don't want to drink out of faucets um, if they don't have lead in their water? If we've, we're spending about half a million a year, and this board has been very proactive on reducing water since uh, four years, so you would think with that amount, if you were to put it in the capital budget to replace, but it looks like people just prefer bottled water. Is that the reasoning why we're not uh, seeing a reduction in our bottled water uh, usage? Uh, that, that is a separate conversation, uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's up to board and superintendent to decide that piece that hasn't been decided yet. But we have continued to provide bottled water to every child throughout the school system. Okay. Thank you. Actually, my question was for Ms. Shea. I got distracted. Sorry. Um, so the pilot that you're talking about was literally launched yesterday, a day ago? Yes, correct. What would be a good time period to gauge the efficiency of that pilot study? It's a great question. Thank you. So I want to also um, frame it that we now have access to third party um, parties that rate high quality instructional materials, which we didn't used to have. So although it's a short time period in one marking period, we selected a product that meets the highest standards from Ed Reports, which is a nationally recognized organization that vets curricula to ensure it's high quality instructional materials. We also have ratings from six different states um, that have independently reviewed this series. So we're going into this pilot with a lot more um, evidence base that it is a high quality instructional material. So really the goal of the pilot is how do our teachers believe it fits in Baltimore County? So how does it integrate in Schoology? How do our students access the materials and find them engaging and culturally responsive? So our goal in our timeline is to come to the curriculum committee in May with an update on how it's going. Uh, we would have feedback from our pilot teachers as well as um, student data from some of the curriculum-based assessments that they would have an opportunity to do, um, and then further that in June at the contracts committee. So that's the timeline that we're operating under. Um, I'm not going to be able to show a change in the MCAP scores that they're going to be taking prior to even having access to this curriculum, um, but that would certainly be a part of the ongoing evaluation of the success of any product that we used. So as a data-driven person, I don't think three months is an appropriate amount of time to make that decision, yeah. especially if you've received uh, data from other states that have given it a positive. Uh, but every school is different. We might have a negative or positive. Um, so that's my concern is to coming back to the board in three months and asking for funding or not about a pilot study that didn't get enough time to take hold. Right. I, I think what what I want to try to clarify is what we're piloting is the how, not the what. So that's the distinction. I'm no longer, sometimes in the past what we were piloting was a homegrown curriculum. We would hire teachers in the summer, they would write something from scratch aligned to standards, and we truly were piloting to determine yes or no. Now we have these really highly regarded um, sources that tell us this has already met standards of excellence for high quality instructional materials. So I'm really bringing to the board the evidence base from all of those multi-year research studies, as well as the information of how our teachers implemented it here and the feedback they gave about how we best support them. So I think that's an important distinction. If I was going in cold, you're absolutely right, three months is not enough time. But I'm going in with a wealth of research from these different organizations in different states, as well as the practical implementation feedback from our teachers and our students. And I feel like combined, that should be a good, I'm hopeful that that's a good position for us to be in. Thank you, Ms. Shea. That's what I wanted to hear. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Causey? 
Thank you. I move that the board office budget be increased with additional funding in the amount of $30,000. Is there a second? I'll second it. I'll second that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Mack and Mr. McMillian. Any discussion? Would you like May to speak to your motion? Yes, Ms. thank you. Um, currently, um, there are multiple public works recommendations where the suggested implementation timeline is uh, well past. Um, and there are some others that would be very beneficial to have in place uh, before a new board takes over uh, in December after we have elections and new appointments. Um, currently, the amount that's recommended does not cover uh, what would be reasonably projected just for the legal fees. And also, one of the recommendations is uh, to ensure that board training funds are not transferred for other expenses. So um, those are my reasonings, and um, I hope that the board would support it. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions, board members? Dr. Hager and then Ms. Scott. I, just, and then I would be curious to ask why $30,000. It seems like a very specific and rather small amount, honestly, given everything else. I was trying to be conservative, but the... Uh, we receive Board of Education of Baltimore County um, account summaries for the board office. And so there are expenditures that um, are not accounted for this in terms of conference fees, overnight travel per diem. Um, and the, the conference fees would also be professional development, uh, but also the professional dues. Um, and then some cushion for additional expenses. So I think that this board has a lot of work to do. And um, this board, I believe, is also dedicated to doing it. And I think we need to do more of it sooner rather than later. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. Um, I've been speaking since the Public Works um, Efficiency Review came out that we need to have updates. We need to have updates about it, which there have not been updates. I think just to throw money at it without having updates as to where we are, there were some things that were already completed that didn't require amounts of money. And that just to me seems like an arbitrary amount um, without anything really tied to it. Uh, one of the recommendations that they had was for uh, parliamentarian training. That's not an, an exorbitant amount. There's, uh, it was the civility code, which we created, which was this. That's not an exorbitant amount. There are things in there that um, the, the chair is in charge of doing and, um, and having and facilitating for us to do as a board. So 30000 to me seems arbitrary. It, um, it, it, it just does not seem relevant to um, the public works um, suggestions. There are things in there that she suggested also that we need to do that we as a board have not even addressed, that we haven't even worked on, that don't even require money. So I will not be supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, is this for the current fiscal year, or are you asking that for the, the, the coming fiscal year? for the current fiscal year coming in this bat tonight. Uh, and, and again, like the other board members said, it's a very arbitrary number. And last year, this board did not do a lot of professional training. Many people did not attend conferences. Half of our board does not. Um, and that money then ended up going to legal services. So that's my concern about adding a, uh, and our legal expenses have been higher in the past two years than they were. So my concern is we add this money, and no offense to you, Mr. Mercedes, it might just end up getting absorbed by legal because uh, some of those trainings are free. I did an OMA training online. It was free. A lot of the trainings made conventions. Uh, and I have seen less than half of this board attend some of those professional development. That is critical to see what's going on in other school districts. Um, so I... I can agree with that amount uh, or that motion for that very reason that it will get absorbed in another category instead of professional development. Thank you. So I'd like to speak to the motion, um, if I may. I will be supporting this. I believe there are actions that we need to complete before the end of the fiscal year that MABE can help us with, um, and we we have an opportunity here. It is a small amount, I believe. Um, we have not had a budgeted amount for training before now. Um, this is something we need to prepare for. In, in terms of the amount, I agree with what Dr. Hager said, but given the time left in the fiscal year, I think it's appropriate. 
um, and given the, t the time left and the realistic expectations of the work that we can complete um, this fiscal year. So I will be supporting the motion for, for that reason. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I'm wondering how much money do we currently have allocated that we could use for training service, the, thing, the things that were just referenced? We, we get those reports on a regular basis, but there is no budget amount for the public works recommendations to implement those. Okay, but my question is like, couldn't we use some of the money that we already have allocated to go towards those public works recommendations? Yeah. I just, I feel like my, my point is similar to some former comments, like $30,000, I'm not sure where that's going to go. And I feel like there's not that much time left in, in this fiscal year, so I don't know. I, I can't vote on this, but I, I wouldn't be in support of it if I could. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yeah, so this is a, a bat transfer, not a, a budget um, allocation. And so I guess what I'm wondering is if we increase the money that we want transferred into a department, where are we suggesting that this $30,000 come from? Ms. Causey, do you want to speak to that? Um, I would leave that to staff to determine what bucket it comes from. So could staff answer if there is a bucket in the current fiscal year that is $30,000 in surplus um, that this could come from? Uh, Ms. Rowe, the, the BAT as presented would have enough flexibility to move $30,000 into the board budget from underspend in other areas of Activity 1 throughout the organization. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tantliff. Ms. Joes? Thank you. Um, so our MABE membership is paid already for this current fiscal year as is our NSBA membership and MABE allows us one free retreat which this board usually does it in January. We haven't even still done that. It's April. So I, the next three months we put in $30,000 and this was an uh, official finding by the Office of Inspector General of Education that we put this money and it's going to end up going into a category like legal fees where we overspend unless I'm specific that members are going to do training and learn because ignorance has a, a cost as well, uh, I cannot support this motion. Okay, Dr. Hager. So right now the VAT specifies 87000 for board legal fees. So would this $30,000 in this motion be specific for professional development or for specific for the... Um, the board, sorry, public works uh, recommendations. Like, wh wh how is how will it, is it being specified? I, I'm putting it into the board office, and I think that the board can um, either through the chair working with uh, uh, our administrator and committee chairs can allocate it, or we can come back to the board next week. Um, and in terms of where the numbers are coming from, we receive these account summary sheets, which I've looked over. So if other board members haven't looked over them, I suggest they do, and the numbers uh, could make a little more sense, I believe. And the, if I may um, add to that, the 87 is based on projections that were calculated on for legal fees. So those have already been accounted for. And similar to the questions about the pilot um, project, if this money is not spent, it would go back to the BCPS. It wouldn't get rolled over into a different category necessarily. No, all general fund underspending at year end goes into our fund balance. It doesn't matter which category it came from. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, board members? I will, I will, Dr. Williams? I would just like to um, urge the board to talk about, I think it was said, we have May and June. You have May and June for this current fiscal year. And if there's some activities that you're trying to do, I think that's important to develop that schedule of next steps inclusive of a retreat, whether it occurs this fiscal year or next fiscal year. Um, and so when we discuss the BAT, I just wanted to reiterate why we came up with that amount was around the legal fees that were not budgeted for this year. The professional development, I, I do associate with what Mr. Thomas and others are saying. Think about what your plan is and then what's coming up in the next two, week, two months, if that is even feasible, 
um, to actually plan some professional development, especially if you haven't utilized the resources affiliated with MAVE and other organizations. So I just, I just offer that feedback. Thank you. Anyone else? Just because you, can you make it quick? Because I'm going to call I the roll call vote. You've spoken several the, times yes, on this. Comments. The board has utilized all of the funding uh, available to it for professional develop and conference fees um, and MAVE's access already. So if we want to try and get additional work done, then we need additional funding. And I've heard complaints from board members that we haven't implemented all of public works. How can we when we don't have any staff available to do it and we have no resources uh, with which to do it? So this uh, will align us with the OIGE recommendations as well as provide the board uh, Okay, thank you. To do the work. Mr. Thank Chantle, you. if I have a question. Um, should the board register for professional development and those expenses are incurred this fiscal year, even though the professional development would, say, take place next fiscal year, would those use um, the appropriation for the current fiscal year or would that use next year's um, If you were registering for a course, you could pay for it this year. Okay, so we don't... Um, Anything you that pay for, for this year, year would would hit the budget hit this year. This year, I mean, budget. if you were going to a hotel and they didn't charge you till you arrived in July, <clears throat> that would hit next fiscal year. Okay. That part of it. So worst case, we we could always pay for a register for next year. professional development that we plan to attend next fiscal year in advance if registration were open. Let's say, yes, the you board could members do that. generally take. Great, thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Tom? I'm sorry. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. <laughs> Seven? Seven. The motion carries. Ms. Hen? Yes. I'd like the record to reflect that I would have voted no if I had a vote. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes. Also, I had a question in there um, before the vote was taken, but there are a lot of recommendations in there from Public Works that require no funding whatsoever. So what do you say about those? How will those um, be implemented? So that's not the um, topic of discussion right now. We are moving on to the... Okay. Next topic, thank you. Mr. Thomas? Thank you, can we go back to the discussion about the water bottles in, in schools? That's not, not appropriate. It's not related to, to the bat? At this point. I'm sending it to you. Okay, thank you. Correct. Other, other questions on the consideration of the budget appropriation transfer? Mrs. Causey? Is it possible to prepay for transportation routing software? Uh, I think we'd need to understand the situation. I don't know if I, I can answer that question all, without any details. I understand there's an RFP. Are you familiar with the? Yeah, when you, when That's you say time. prepay, you have to, I mean, we have to have, we have to kind of know what we're buying. Yeah, we'd have to know what we're buying. Once you know what you're buying, if you know what you're buying prior to June 30th, you can execute um, a purchase order and spend the dollars in the current year. If you don't, then time passes thank you <laughs> thank you I want to note I had that, no questions but I'm out of time okay Miss Scott you you asked your question or you you had a different question not related to the bat do you have any questions on the bat uh, related to the bat no I, I did not thank you thank you um, Miss Mack oh you're stepping away okay any other questions before we call the vote Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the fiscal year 2022 budget appropriation transfer as, amend, as amended? Ms. Hen, could I make one clarification before yes. you? The BAT as presented is, uh, will cover the 30,000. So the BAT itself does not need to be amended to move the $30,000 into the board budget. I just wanted to clarify that. That'll just be one of the 
under where underpinnings of it will make sure the thirty thousand gets moved from some place where there's an overage. Within the activity base. Yeah, within that same activity. Does not need to reflect the board's action in moving the thirty thousand. It, we we can change the words if you'd like, but the dollars won't change that are reflected in the bat because when we put the bat together, we make sure we can cover variations that are likely to happen in the balance of the year. We don't you know do it to the dollar. We leave some cushion in there. Okay, so the bat that gets presented then to the county council will mirror what we are approving now. Is in other words, is yes, that the as an accurate statement if we approve it as presented. Yes. Okay. Mrs. Causey, is, is, are you? Well, what we can, here's what I think what we're talking about. You're talking about basically a budget line item transfer in effect. So we can execute that budget line item transfer, but the activities within the overall bat will stay the same. So you guys Got will it. get, you, the board gets what, what you want, and we can, we can move it forward to the county. Okay. Board members, is everyone clear on the difference in what our action did? Was in effect a budget line transfer versus amending the VAT. Okay, so I will um, withdraw my question then and ask for a motion to approve the fiscal year 2022 budget appropriation transfer as presented in Exhibit N. So I moved, Offerman. Second, Ken. Thank you. Um, any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Gonna pass for now. I'm sorry? Pass. Passed. You can come, come back, back to me you? at the end. Yes, please. Ms. Mack? Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Hem. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Ms. Hen. Yes. I'd like the record to reflect that as the representative of 111,000 students, I would have voted in support of this. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies. And for that, I call on the Policy Review Committee Chair, Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I, my volume cut out for a minute. Quite all right. Um, Ms. Rowe, we are on item O, consideration of board policies. Oh, thank you. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Policy 6400, special programs, magnet programs. Policy 6402, special programs, special education services. This recommendation is presented to you on tonight's agenda as exhibit O. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? Ms. Hen, can I ask that we separate out, uh, separate the policies please? Sure. Um, do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee for policy 6400? So moved, Hager. Thank you, Dr. Hager. No second is needed. Is there any discussion? Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Um, I move to insert priority placements for students with the greatest academic performance in line with these guidelines is prohibited. To line 32 on page one. Madam Chair. The board already deliberated and voted on that exact um, motion at the previous meeting, so I believe the motion's out of order. Um, I will ask for legal advice on that. Mr. Brusades? Was that, in fact, uh, from the chair and yes from? Mm -hmm. On Mr. Thomas? Do you want to speak yes, to that? Yes, I can speak to this, sure, of course. So the last uh, meeting I presented this about priority placements um, in general, as well as it also included a, an item about uh, students who were the children of uh, employees that were currently working at a school. This one is not priority placements in general. It's specifically saying priority placements for students with the greatest academic performance. And so to my understanding, that would exclude those students who are in the art magnet programs when it comes to 
um, performance on art examinations. This is just the students with the greatest academic performance. So I think it is it is similar but different in the way that it, it, it is uh, crafted. I have a point of inquiry. Sure, Ms. Scott. Um, is this a zombie, would this be considered a zombie motion? I'm not familiar with that. Hey. Um, as I understand it, um, is Mark, Ms. Um, is Howie here. As I understand it, as when you present the same motion that's similar at different meetings, so that's what I was seeing if this would be that or if it was um, something separate. I'm, I'm still a little unclear on the difference between what was presented at the prior meeting and what is being presented. I, I believe Ms. Scott is, is correct in my understanding of zombie motions. It is very close to what was originally presented, which would mean Ms. Ms. Rowe um, is correct in that. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I, I tried to be very clear in the, in the creating this specific motion so that it is different from the previous one. They both, yes, do deal with priority, pr priority placements. However, uh, there's, there's many more facets to priority placements that were included in the last motion. And I think I'm just repeating myself. Um, but I, I really would like to discuss this motion. And if it is considered a, a similar motion, then as a board member, don't I, do, don't I still have the right to bring this f motion forward as it is another meeting? I believe it would be a motion to reconsider. And if you'd like to make that motion, it still either requires a second. And Mr. Mercedes, what and, and, does and a motion, motion to reconsider? To reconsider would need to be raised on the same day. Thank you. So that would not apply. Okay. So in order side. for us to discuss it, it would... And the reconsider must be made by the prevailing side, which means you would not be able to make the motion since the original motion failed. I, okay, so the consensus is that this is similar, too similar to the previous motion to review? Board members, any other thoughts? Yes, Ms. Joes. I need clarification from you, Mr. Thomas. How is your motion different from what you presented earlier? If you could just be very specifically clear. Sure. So in the previous motion, and I'm trying to go back to the chat to find it. I don't think I, I have it. Um, that was a much broader definition or kind of, it was much broader when it talked about priority placements where, hey, let me just find the previous motion so I can compare them for you. Um, but I believe that this one is different because it's it's specifically stressing academic performance, and a concern raised by some board members was that in, was that uh, we would be for the students in our arts magnet programs, they would be um, unable to. Hold on, I'm I'm just looking for this. You found it. Thank you. Can you please post it in the chat, Dr. Hager? <laughs> okay, so it says, the last one was I moved to insert B, guidelines shall not include priority selection as enrollment for the children of Baltimore County Public Schools, employees, no grant priority placements to students with the highest performance of such guidelines. So I think this is different because it excludes the children of Baltimore County Public Schools employees, and instead of just saying the highest performance on the guidelines that the superintendent creates, it talks about students with the greatest academic performance in relation to the guidelines. Ms. Joes, point of inquiry. Yeah, um, to Mr. Mercedes, since you are in the, um, Mr. Thomas, you are in the PRC, would it be appropriate for him to take this back to PRC for more robust discussion? Or it's the second reader, so I'm not. And can that motion be made now or? Okay, so I'm going to move that this policy go back to PRC for further consideration. Is there a second? Second. May I have a roll call second vote? Second, Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Um, sure, I'm sure I had a comment on the motion. Ms. Rowe and then Ms. Causey. 
So we have had extensive conversation about this, both in committee and in the last meeting of a similar um, policy. And PRC has a large number of policies that we're trying to get through. And I believe that if the board wants to make this change, that the board should do it in this meeting and not send it back to PRC because I believe that the result would be exactly the same as it was when the policy came out of PRC because we did discuss this, we did vote on it in PRC and it did not approve. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Ms. Causey? I was also gonna comment that I don't think moving it back to PRC will provide any different result. And um, I note that Dr. Williams is not here and um, I don't see the staff person that was here discussing the magnet program because I think when we, it, yeah. oh, okay. Sure, thank you. Um, Ms. Joes? Yeah, I would like to withdraw my motion. Sorry, Mr. Thomas, looks like you don't have the support in PRC, so it'll just be a, we'll let you be playing, so Great. sorry. So we, the original motion then is on the floor. Um, Mr. Thomas, you've, you've spoken multiple times on this. We, we need to continue on and process your motion that you made in the chat was to, I'll read it to if I can amend miss the policy. I believe Ms. Rose was. Was there a second? I, I believe it had a second. It did not have a second. Yeah. Oh. To Ms. Jones, I. Ms. Jones, did second. you second? Um, and she withdrew. Do you withdraw your second? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I just make a, a quick statement and I, I will be quick. We, you've spoken multiple times on it, Mr. Thomas. We need to keep moving along. We've got another policy to get through yet that we've do I, separated. Do I have time? There's been a motion on the floor. You've got 40 seconds. Can, can, Please. Yes. Thank you. So I think we need to remove the rhetoric that students are earning a magnet seat in, in, in Buttermere County Public Schools. We're a public institution and I, I think Magnet programs, the way that we have them right now, are one of the most inequitable ways that we have shaped Baltimore County Public Schools. We need to fix that. We need to focus on this policy. We need to try to make our magnet programs better and more equitable for our students. And I go to a magnet program. I sit in the classroom every single day. And the students I see around me are those highest achieving students at Eastern Tech, at Western Tech, at Carver, the highest achieving students. And we need to find a way to prevent those, these schools of high, high achievers from developing and then having schools right down the street that don't have those same rates of achievement, don't have those highest SAT scores, don't have those highest performance on AP exams. It is despicable. Time. Thank you. So is there a second to the motion, Mr. Thomas's motion? I don't believe there, there had been. I'll second. Okay. Mr. Joe seconds it. We've had ample discussion. May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Yep. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? Point of order. Uh, Ms. Causey, do you have anything else to add? You've spoken on this as well. Did you want to speak to it again? Um, well, I think staff spoke to it very well in the last meeting where yes. the process for the magnet schools is, is uh, very broad in the middle schools, which leads to the high school. Um, and so um, I agree that every student should be able to achieve um, what they want, but it, it, we have limited resources, and especially in these specialized programs, um, it's very difficult to pull all of those resources together for the numbers um, for the numbers of students. And especially when we're speaking about um, our literacy rate and our math proficiency numbers, um, while I appreciate all of this, and I we are making strides in improving magnet program access, we're um, started in the, well, if we get the budget that we asked for, we'll be doing a study to uh, have a magnet soul school on the west side. So we are making improvements in this area. So I don't want anyone to think that this board is not interested in that um, and that staff uh, explained quite a bit about it in the last meeting. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Repeat? Sure. I'll read the motion again. Um, Mr. Thomas moved to insert priority placement for students with the greatest academic performance in line with these guidelines is prohibited to line 32 on page one. I'm calling the vote. Ms. Hunt, I believe vote? that since the motion was seconded, I should be able to speak again. Mr. Thomas, you're, you've used your time. Your time has expired. But the motion was not seconded. 
It was sec seconded. It was just seconded by Mr. But that was after I used my time. You spoke into your motion. We're calling the vote. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Graff? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Hen? No. Thank you. The motion fails. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Policy 6402? So moved, Matt. I'm sorry, 6400. Yes, the first one was 6402. I'm sorry, thank you. Um, the original <coughs> policy, the original motion was, um, do I have a Looking for a motion to adopt the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Policy 6400. So moved, Matt. Thank you. No second. Dr. Dr. Hager had moved it. No second is needed. Any discussion? Ms. Hen. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just need to state for the record that I will not be voting in support of this motion or in this and of this policy. I think it should go back to PRC and it needs to have more robust conversation. Now, I have a personal guilt, personally, because I feel like I'm the direct beneficiary from a system that is broken right now when it comes to our magnet programs. I go to Eastern Tech, and it pains me to see how inequitable our system currently is. It pained me so much that I created a nonprofit last year dedicated to extending some of the resources that Eastern Tech had offered me to local middle schools, to local high schools, trying to fix this issue without being on the Board of Education. And I could not sit here and be an advocate for students if I didn't continue to push you all to see this issue, if I didn't continue to use every second that I have to try to fix this. And I really hope that you all can notice that and can just put a little more time and effort, just, just try to look at this policy and see how we can make it better with me. So I just had to state that or else I, I, I couldn't sit up here. I, I, I don't know what kind of representative I could be if I didn't do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? I'm sorry. Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Okay. Sorry, those were for the original policy that we haven't already shared. Dr. Hager? Ms. Rowe? Yes. I'm sorry, did, did you have comments on? Well, I did, I just wanted to um, say that I believe that it is erroneous to compare whole school magnets and a, a population of students that is 100% magnet high school students to schools and magnet programs that have magnets in schools because the data is not comparable. And I would stack Kenwood High School, IB students, and other magnet program students within other high schools up against Eastern, Carver, and Western any day of the week. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, I just wanted to say to Mr. Thomas, keep using your voice and speaking truth to power and using the opportunities that you've been given to speak for those of us who don't have those opportunities and aren't in those same rooms that you are in. You're in a position and you sit in a space where many are not and you give voice to the voiceless. So don't think that what you're saying is in vain and keep using your voice to speak truth to power. It may be upsetting and frustrating, but you're fine. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Well, thank you, Ms. Hen. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to suggest, uh, since we spent the last two budget committees talking about um, per school funding, if Mr. Thomas has an issue with the funding that is going to schools, that perhaps he reviews some of those materials. It's pretty insightful and it shows significant dollar flows um, across the entire county. And it's probably the best way to really 
um, understand and measure the support that we are able to give um, in our positions uh, in, in the board. So um, I understand that he has a, a great concern uh, at this point in time about magnets in general. Um, but, um, you know, it's a great resource to take a look at um, uh, to fully understand what is happening and what level of resourcing we are providing schools. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Jose. Thank you. Mr. Thomas, you're on the right path. And while this motion didn't pass, don't see this as a loss. You need to fight for it. You've got the passion. And especially since you attend Eastern Tech, I, I, I salute you for actually bringing that inequity out for us to address. And use this as a, as a learning uh, experience and make changes because you can make changes happen. And this is how it's done. So be brave and smile. I, I do feel very passionate since I'm a mom. I can't see a child crying. So be brave. <laughs> Ms. Kazi. Thank you. I just wanted to appreciate the, the passion and, uh, of our student member of the board. And I, I greatly appreciate uh, all the other board members um, chiming in. We uh, are a group, I truly believe, each of us interested in each child that's in our schools. And we have a lot of work to do, but I believe that we are, we are getting through it. And we've been through the worst two years in education. Um, I was at the National School Board Association Conference with Christian and other board members, and it, it was similar around the nation. But we are in recovery, and we are working on these issues, um, a lot of issues, and we will all continue to work. Thank you. Okay. So any other comments before we process the motion on the floor? Okay, which is on policy 6400. But, but I, Mr. McMillian? Christian, I, I remember a conversation I had over 40 years ago, and it was very, very similar to what you've just said. Uh, so I think you, I really think you're onto something because there's kids out there that could benefit from that program or those programs that are not getting those spots. And how you make that, just because they don't test up to a certain level and get that 20%, you know, then they go into the lottery. So I, I really think you're onto something. But it's, it's how, you know, and you're gonna have a fight. But I think you're on to something. And I swear to God, as I sit here, I had the same conversation 40 years ago. And the man that I was talking to said, Rod, it works. Don't mess with it. It works. But does it work for everybody? I don't think it does. So you're on to something. You really are. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. No. <laughs> Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Policy 6402, Special Programs, Special Education Services? So moved, Hager. Thank you. No second is needed. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jokes? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Uh, Ms. Yes. Ms. Yes. 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 The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is the report on the 2021 adjusted cohort graduation. And for that, I call on Dr. McComas. 
Madam Chair, we, we may we make may we have a uh, two minute recess. While everyone's approaching, if you'd like to take one, I'm not going to formally recess, Mrs. Causey. Good evening. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Just go ahead. <laughs> so good evening, uh, Dr. Williams, Chair Han, members of the board. Um, our team and I are here this evening uh, to, sh to present um, our academic achievement report for 2021 on the adjusted cohort graduation and dropout rates. I'm joined this evening. Um, to my right, I have uh, Mr. Sam Mustafer, our executive director of secondary schools. Um, also, I have Principal Weslowski. Uh, <laughs> thank you, our proud principal of Chesapeake High School. We have Ms. Kim Ferguson, our executive director. Of, of climate, and we also have Mr. Kevin Conley, our executive director of um, accountability, research and accountability. Thank you. Next slide, please. Oh, are the slides up? Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, and so this evening, the Compass Air Pathway of Excellence, of course, we pro provides us a system-wide focus on raising our bar, closing the gaps, and preparing our students for their future. Our dedication to ensuring that our students do graduate college and career is a thoughtful and research-based approach to understanding the key metrics of student progress across the school levels. Graduation and dropout rate are the essential data that we will share as part of our focus this evening uh, for preparing students for their post-secondary success. And this is just one example of how our compass intentionally raises the bar for all students to promote the college and career readiness. Next slide, please. At this point, I'll hand it over to Mr. Conley. Thank you, Dr. McComas. The Maryland State Department of Education defines the four-year adjusted cohort graduation rate as the number of students who graduate in four years with a regular high school diploma divided by the number of students who form the adjusted cohort for the graduating class. And what that means is the adjusted cohort includes the number of first-time grade nine students plus the number of students who transfer in minus the number of students who transfer out, emigrate, or are deceased during that four-year period. The four-year graduation rate for 2021 is the percent of students in that 2018 cohort who earned a regular diploma by the end of 2021, which includes summer school. The adjusted four-year graduation rate for the last three years are displayed in green for MSDE and blue for BCPS. <clears throat> the BCPS four-year graduation rate was greater in 2019 and 2020 than the state average and 1% less than the state average in 2021. The 2021 graduation rate for Maryland's five largest school systems, including Baltimore City, Prince George's, Anne Arundel, <clears throat> Baltimore County, and Montgomery counties, ranged from 69.2% to 91.37%. Of this group, BCPS had the third highest graduation rate of 86.2%. Changes in graduation rates are attributable to course credits earned during the challenges of the COVID-19 global pandemic. Next slide, please. Thank you. Overall, the adjusted cohort graduation rate decreased by 1.5% from 2019 to 2021 during the COVID-19 global pandemic. While the number of total BCPS graduates increased during that time, Interruptions to instruction caused by the COVID-19 global pandemic 
may have impacted the on-track and on-time graduation of some of our students. Graduation rate by gender shows that female students had a graduation rate of 90.3%, while male students had a graduation rate of 82.3%. It is important to note that students who are Hispanic Latino had a 1.6% increase in graduation rate during the same period. BCPS incorporates a variety of programs, strategies, and interventions to promote increased graduation rates for all students while partnering with community services, county government, MSDE, and other local school systems to investigate and share best practices. We will continue to coordinate differentiated supports for improving graduation rates for those students who've experienced a greater challenge in graduating on time during the COVID-19 global pandemic and the accompanying periodic surges and variants which resulted in illnesses and lost instructional time. Next slide, please. Students who receive services for English language learner, free and reduced meals, and special education had graduation rates that were lower than all students over the past three years. Students who are English language learners had the greatest gaps in graduation rates compared to all students or student groups from 2019 to 2021. It should be noted that students who receive services as English language learners had a 0.8% increase in the adjusted cohort graduation rate from 2019 to 2021. The graduation rates of our students eligible for free and reduced meals, special education, and English language services continues to be our greatest area of focus for improvement in graduation rates. System improvement team initiatives are designed to engage and re-engage students in school while school level initiatives build positive relationships with families, consistently communicate with students on their status and barriers for staying on track to graduate, and provide constant coaching, outreach, and support to students at risk for not graduating on time. Next slide, please. The Maryland State Department of Ed Education for dropout rate defines this group as a student who for any reason other than being deceased, leaves school before graduation or the completion of a Maryland approved educational program and is not known to enroll in another school or state approved program. Over the past three years, BCPS has had a dropout rate within zero to 1.1% of the state dropout average. The dropout rates for Maryland's five largest school systems range from 15.4% to 4.5%. Of this group, BCPS had the third lowest dropout rate of 8.5%. Next slide, please. Overall, the 2021 dropout rate for all students decreased by 0.3% from 2019 to 2021. Of particular importance is the dropout rate for students who are Hispanic Latino, which decreased by 4.1% from 2019 to 2021. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Students receiving services for English language learner, free and reduced meals, and special education had dropout rates greater than all students group. Students who are English language learners have dropout rates higher than all other student or service groups. It's important to note that the dropout rate for students receiving English language learners decreased by 4.5% from 2019 to 2021. Next slide, please. Additional highlights for our 2021 adjusted graduation group include the following. The 2021 cohort included 407 more students compared to the 2019 cohort, with a total 2021-2020 uh, graduation count of 7,232 students. 11 high schools maintained a 90% or greater graduation rate for the past two years. 13 high schools had decreased student dropout rates from 2019 to 2021, and the five-year adjusted cohort rate for 2020 was 89.3%, an increase of 0.8%, meaning 67 additional students graduated within five years of their cohort. Typically, the five-year focus on graduation 
benefits students who need additional time to complete course or testing requirements for graduation in the fifth year of high school, such as students who have developing English proficiency skills or students who are participating in credit recovery programs. Next, Ms. Kim Ferguson will share with us some highlights regarding the post-secondary students. Thank you, Mr. Conley. Before we go any further, I'd like to take the liberty of bragging on the post-secondary accomplishments of the class of 2021. The class of 2021 was awarded a total of $1,887,312,000 in scholarships. <laughs> All right. Of the 7,232 graduates, 5,159 students were accepted to a two-year or a four-year college. Most students remained in the state with the top five colleges, college choices of CCBC, Towson, uh, University of Maryland College Park, University of Maryland Baltimore County, and Morgan State University. 555 students were accepted to historically black college or universities, and 31 students were accepted to an Ivy League university. Baltimore County Public Schools also had 13 national merit finalists. Next slide, please. Schools and central offices provide direct supports to students to promote increased attendance, success in coursework, dropout prevention, and staying on track for on-time graduation requirements, which include student lear service learning hours, state assessment requirements, and course completion. At the system level, initiatives to promote graduation include on-track indicators for coursework, state assessment requirements, student service learning hours, educational options, supports to schools for graduation project graduation, and individual student supports from multidisciplinary teams. Baltimore County Public Schools Department of Academic Programs and Options has a significant impact on BCPS's graduation rates through the provision of self-paced blended learning programs that include extended day learning program, extended year learning program, and school programs for acceleration and recovery. At the school level, preparing students to graduate on time begins in kindergarten with the development of positive relationships, student engagement, effective work habits, and consistent attendance. The school counseling team work in conjunction with student support services, working in conjunction with student support services meets with students and parents or caregivers to map out secondary and post-secondary goals, including coursework, graduation requirements, and enrichment pathways. School teams implement initiatives such as project, project graduation, individual counseling, academic advising, attendance meetings, parent-teacher conferences, and support from multidisciplinary teams. Communication and collaboration between school staff and students and families are essential to graduation and successful college and career pathways. Students parents and caregivers are engaged in student planning throughout the K-12 experience. Parents are able to view their child's progress using the Focus Parent Portal and communicate with staff through Schoology. Every student and parent or caregiver has access to the web-based college and career readiness tool, Naviance, beginning in seventh grade. Through Naviance, parents review assessment results and college planning progress and, and plan for college for their children. School counselors communicate academic, magnet, and financial aid opportunities by engaging parents by way of Naviance and Schoology. Students and families are essential partners in this work. As staff, we listen to understand, advocate, inform, but mostly we, most importantly, we care. We care about all of our students and how best we can serve their families throughout their journey towards graduation. At this time, Mr. Mustafa will share how the Department of Schools support high school leaders with ensuring that students graduate on time. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ms. Ferguson. 
As Ms. Ferguson stated, central offices work with schools to provide direct support to students to help them meet all necessary requirements to earn a Maryland High School diploma. The Department of Schools works to ensure that the support is differentiated to meet the needs of each school and each community. Our work includes analyzing key metrics related to graduation, which include student grades, course credits, attendance, state assessments, and student service learning hours to ensure that our students are meeting with success. In addition, our data analysis helps us to identify the resources and supports needed for students who are not meeting the graduation requirements. As you have heard many times from our superintendent, Dr. Williams, and as we, as executive directors of schools, have been charged with by our chief of schools, Dr. Zarchin, we must use data as a flashlight. Our data analysis helps us to identify what we are all doing well to support our students and helps us to identify areas where there is needed growth and improvement. The senior cohort analysis tool is one mechanism that we use in the data analysis process. It is a tool that we use to collect and analyze pertinent information related to each high school's graduation projections. Schools submit their senior cohort analysis tool to their executive directors at the midpoint and end of each quarter. The analysis tools helps us to monitor each school's support to students. Project graduation meetings are a collaborative work session held centrally and at individual schools to analyze and review data pertaining to a cohort or individual students to ensure that students are meeting the graduation requirements outlined up by our school system and the Maryland State Department of Education. In addition to identify the needed supports and resources for students not on track to graduate with their cohort. The picture on the screen is from our most recent project graduation meeting held on March 22nd, 2022. Our cross divisional work is essential to the success of our schools. The Department of Schools works collaboratively with the departments of research accountability and assessment, social emotional support, <laughs> academics, information technology, and educational options to discuss graduation requirements, analyze data, and discuss our support to schools. We all know that we still have a lot of work to do until we graduate every eligible student who comes through our doors. But for today, we're going to showcase a principal and her school team who are utilizing the supports and resources to help our students meet with success. Now you will hear from one of our outstanding principals, Ms. Amy Weslowski, principal of Chesapeake High School. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Mustafer. Chesapeake High School Stenham Academy is proud of the work that we have done over the past two years through the most difficult of times with all of our students and particularly our recent graduates. Chesapeake, along with the other 23 Baltimore County high schools, have to find creative ways to keep our kids connected, motivated, and across the stage. The collaboration and support between all high school principals, particularly for me as a new high school principal, was paramount. Special thanks to my veteran Eastside principal family that are always on call to answer my questions. The previous slides detail strategies that all BCPS high schools utilize to prepare students to graduate. Each principal works tirelessly to refine these proven strategies and we tailor them for the needs of our specific population. The articulation between our feeder patterns is essential to anticipate the needs of our community. As the principal of Chesapeake High School, I am extremely proud to be sitting here in front of you this evening because at Chesapeake we defied the odds and increased our graduation rate by 5.6% and decreased our dropout rate by 4.9 over the past three years. This is a moment to pause, celebrate, and reflect. Often we are tasked with identifying the strategies and initiatives that led to the success in hopes that we can duplicate the results. I can say with confidence 
that the reason that our graduate graduation rate increased even through the darkest of the pandemic is not because of a strategy or program. It is because of the people and the environment that we intentionally cultivated. The dedicated adults at Chesapeake ensure that every student has a person. Cultivating and maintaining connections to foster belonging with our student has been integral to building a community rooted in our core values. When the world shut down, Chesapeake came together. I've read that a building takes on the personality of the principal, but it is important to me that each member of the Chesapeake community sees themselves reflected in our value and our work. Over several months, all stakeholders, including students, collaborated to identify our school-wide values, which has been there the anchor. At Chesapeake High School, our core values are flexibility, belonging, equity, and authenticity. Leaning into our value of flexibility, knowing our students utilize digital forms of media to connect, in March of 2020, we launched several efforts to strengthen relationships and a sense of belonging that are still thriving. From my principal Instagram account to a school-wide Schoology group, students were instantly connected with each other and every adult. The CHS Hub Schoology Group acts as an open forum for students to pose curious and challenging questions, a space to explore social justice and current events, share their favorite books, and even cooking tips. The, this prompted a focus to use Schoology to, tools in creative ways. For example, the messaging feature broke the barriers for students, especially seniors, to access adults in support of their graduation. Our amazing school counselors and assistant principals message seniors on their caseloads daily in response. And in response, personalize each student's path to graduation. With specialized QR codes, counselors made themselves available by setting up a virtual and counseling office so that students could reach them quickly with their phones. Our faculty and staff stayed connected with our seniors 24 seven, offering enrichment, tutoring, words of encouragement, and a listening ear. The constant contact ensured the parents were also aware of their students' progress. As a principal, I could not have been prouder to see so many adults working together to ensure the su success of our seniors. Our hope is that every day, every Bayhawk is given the opportunity to be connected. Every day, every Bayhawk is challenged by new learning and experiences. And every day, every Bayhawk knows they have someone they can turn to. Because once a Bayhawk, always a Bayhawk. Next, I know, right? <laughs> Go Bayhawk! <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, on this slide and the following slide, of course, is our ongoing schedule of upcoming academic reports. Um, thank you. This concludes our presentation. I just want to add a, a few points. Um, I want to thank the team um, for being here. I know it's a late evening, but I want to just highlight Chesapeake High School again, that they had an increased graduation rate of 5.7% over the last three years. But in addition to that, Chesapeake ha High School had the higher graduation rate than the state average for the following student groups, all students, our African-American students and students receiving special ed services and students receiving English language learners. And so we wanted to highlight, we could have highlighted many of our schools, as Mr. Connolly said, we had 11 high schools that had a 90 plus percent graduation rate. But particularly Chesapeake, when you're talking about closing gaps, when you look at this school and what they have done, compared to others and the higher graduation rate than the state average, but also within those several student groups. I just wanted to highlight that for the board. Thank you. And they're not alone, so I just want to say there are other schools, but I just wanted to highlight about Chesapeake. Thank you. Give me some. <laughs> uh, Ms. Hen stepped out. Are there any questions from the board? I see Ms. Joes first, please. Thank you, Vice Chair McMillian. First of all, congratulations. That's quite an achievement to raise up your graduation rates in the middle of a global pandemic. Thank you. Um, and I heard key words from you, people, flexibility, equity, 
belonging. Those seem to be like the theme that helped, and Dr. Williams just highlighted because those the the the. The kids that we are failing are the English language learners, African American, Hispanic, and our um, differently abled children that receive special education. Those are the kids we are failing. And you see a common theme of kids that are disadvantaged that we are failing. And I want to point quickly to Mr. Thomas on this one. Mr. Thomas got graduate, has got accepted into many colleges, including Yale. <laughs> right? Let's take a bow. Congratulations. <laughs> Yet, Mr. Thomas is over here fighting for the, the kids that are falling between the cracks. And for that, that I give you much um, you know, applause for that. Because he's not fighting for himself. He's made it. He's fighting for those kids that we are failing. And at, at a very high level, as a board level, um, Dr. Williams will say, we would like to put in any resources that we could at a governance level to help uh, more Chesapeake high schools across our system and provide that support. So. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Mr. Thomas is next. Well, thank you, Ms. Joes, for, for that shout out. Um, but I wanted to thank our, our principal, um, Wisloski. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, I visited Chesapeake before, and my little brother goes to Chesapeake High School, right. and it has been an incredibly transformative place for my brother. We've seen him this past year grow into a, such an incredible young man, and I have you to thank for that, and the individuals at your school that have really made that school such a special place. Um, one of the, 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 the things that I noticed in this presentation was if we look at our Hispanic and Latino populations, you know, their graduation rates are are the ones that are the lowest. And the dropout rates for Hispanic and Latino students are the highest. And when I compare this to our virtual learning program data that we received, the virtual learning program data showed that the reason that a lot of the students were in VLP was because they performed, or Hispanic and Latino students, was because they performed better in VLP. Because that, that was, those were the, the highest marks in the presentation we had in our equity committee. And so I, I think when we're looking at this, like. There is something within our Hispanic and Latino population that we need to focus in on, and we need to try to see what it, where we can assist those students kind of the most, because those are, are the ones who indicated that they learn better virtually from the 54 students we have in VOP that, that are in that, that are Hispanic and Latino, um, completed the survey, and also with this data. So I just wanted to point that out, because I think that that's something that I've been really seeing throughout a lot of the data in our system. And that could be tied to them being English language learners, or it could be tied to something else. So. I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Ms. Max, next. Ms. Mack. I'm sorry. I, I was muted. Um, thank you very much for this um, presentation. Um, on page three, we show that the BCPS graduation rate is 86.2, and the dropout rate is on page, um, I'm sorry, the dropout um, rate is 8.52. Can you help me understand what happened to the 5.28% 5 5 of students that neither graduated nor dropped out? So I'm going to ask Mr. Connolly to respond. We get that question every year when you think, I want to remind the board, the cohort that begins as ninth graders, but Mr. Connolly will definitely give the answer. Mr. Connolly. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, first and foremost, we have some students who are certificate bound, meaning they're not diploma bound. Um, by state Comar regulations, those students are not considered graduates. So that's a, a part of that population. A second part of the population are for students who need that additional time to graduate. They may be fifth year or even six year graduates. Some of those students are second language learners. Um, some of those students are new to our country and they need extra time to develop the proficiency skills necessary to pass the graduation course assessments. Um, and some of those students are students who need credit recovery, whether they were with us or coming to us from other school systems. Um, we also do have a small number of students that we consider hanging transfers, which are students who have come into Baltimore County and left Baltimore County and ha have not enrolled or notified um, you know, the state that they have enrolled in any type of program. And it's a very small number of students, uh, but those typically are the groups that comprise that five plus percent. Oh, thank you very much for that answer, Mr. Conley. Um, what graduation requirements were weighed by MSDE as a result of the pandemic for 2021? 
Great. So uh, what I want to share with you as part of the presentation was that we had discussed um, course credits as being the predominant reason why students uh, will or will not graduate from the from the class of 2021. In 19, in 2019-2020, mm -hmm. um, we had you know a pass-fail process which promoted a higher level of course credits for students based on the idea of a pass-fail in that last three months of the pandemic. You know, for the 2020-2021 school year, we did not have that um, pass-fail as an option. So, student credit course credits was a significant indicator of graduation or of needing more time to graduate. Student service learning hours were waived by MSDE as well as graduation requirements for state assessments. Okay, and then my last question is, um, pre-pandemic, approximately 13% of BCPS students met graduation requirements using a bridge plan, which I understand bridge plans went away. What replaced bridge plans and when was the replacement implemented? So currently the uh, MSDE is working with the State Board of Education to revise COMAR to include uh, sep uh, different pathways as part of the blueprint for Maryland's uh, future. And those different pathways include support pathways and college and career readiness pathways. Those pathways are intended to not only support students on time graduation, but to also provide them with additional opportunities for college, career, and service um, readiness. So were bridge plans in effect in 2021? No, bridge plans were not in effect for 2021. Um, bridge plans are utilized when students pass the course, but do not pass the assessment and show an alternative right. pathway for being able to demonstrate the standards that the assessment um, would require. Since assessments were waived, bridge plans were unnecessary. Students had to pass courses in order to earn um, credit. That makes sense. Thank you very much You're for, your, for the information. Dr. Hager. Um, thank you. Just a few quick questions. Um, so I saw that you presented three years of data, which was really helpful because I feel like 2020 is kind of a, you know, is, is it really useful? Um, so moving forward, has there been any guidance on potentially removing that year of data and just looking at trends um, in 1921 and moving forward? Yeah, so when we um, package data together to, to really try to show, you know, um, the impact of our initiatives and our investments, um, we know that there are outliers. You know, there's outliers involved due to COVID-19 um, pandemic uh, changes in the way that we provided instruction, the way that the state was able to assess. Um, so to average those types of data together to say, you know, this is the trend would not be appropriate because we know that, you know, it's not typical of data. But what we really want to look at closely is um, what were those benchmarks that we established pre-pandemic? And then where are we now? And where are we going? And so looking at that disaggregation um, of data for students, especially student groups that are most marginalized, as, as Ms. Yost had, had called out, you know, that's you know, where our work has to focus because we need to identify if we've had an, either, an even greater impact um, of uh, the COVID-19 for some student groups. And what does that then mean when it comes to allocation of resources, supports, and providing what students need in order to accelerate their learning. Great, great, thank you. Um, and I, I also appreciated that you mentioned comparisons with the other larger districts in Maryland. Um, uh, I know you said it and, and it wasn't on the slides. I, I like seeing things. So um, if, if in the future, you know, you end up choosing to make that comparison, I would love to see the numbers um, on a slide just personally. Great. Um, and then I haven't figured out how to ask this question appropriately, but the I feel like people say a lot that, you know, there is a metric that people want to get to, and so there are kids who end up graduating who may maybe should or shouldn't graduate. And um, whether that's true or not, I know it's something that's, that's promoted sometimes. So is the Department of School Support, is that what they're there for, is to kind of catch those kids that, um, 
you know, could end up not graduating and kind of be their safety net to kind of propel them forward? Is, is that what that department is for? I was trying to follow So um, first and foremost, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Ms. Ferguson. But as Sam had mentioned, Mr. Mustafer had mentioned in the project graduation, it is a cross-disciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. And it involves multiple uh, different groups of people looking at multiple things because the factors may range for a variety of different reasons. But to answer your question in a, in a short format. <laughs> <laughs> So pretty much what um, Mr. Connolly said. So the project graduation um, is the purpose of that is to actually review to make sure we catch those students. So um, we're looking at those students on a regular basis. And I think Mr. Mustafa talked about an additional mechanism and data that he uses as an um, executive director where they look at data every quarter for students to to identify whether or not those students are on track. Um, so that's the whole purpose in catching kids. Um, when you say catch them, we're trying to catch them and keep them from failing right. and try to intervene before um, they get to that point. Okay. Correct. And, and um, as they were stating, so we have project graduation meetings at each individual high school, but we also have them centralized as well. And our last centralized one, uh, it was the March 22nd, and we'll have another centralized one uh, in May. Um, so. Every, twice a quarter, we collect what's called a senior cohort analysis too, and it, it allows us to um, collect that data which shows which students are not meeting with success. And we disaggregate the data based on different metrics. So we look at student service learning hours. We look at assessments because although sometimes MSDE over the years, assessments has been taken away as far as kids do not need to pass them in order to graduate, they still may need to take them in order to graduate. So we still have to look at that to see if Sam Mustard, if Kim Ferguson, if Kevin, if Amy if they actually sat for the assessment. So we look at each of those students and the students who are not meeting with success, now we have to identify what supports are we putting in place to help them meet with success. And that can mean different things. Parent meetings, meeting with the um, school counseling team, bringing uh, in a multidisciplinary team, PPWs, social workers, so whomever we need to bring in to support the students. Because we know in small occasions, students can graduate in three years. But we also know that some of our student, students need extra time, as Mr. Connolly talked about, and that's when we're looking at the five-year cohort. But most students, of course, graduate uh, in, in four years. So the support um, is there, and, and the principals are, and their school teams are doing what they need to do to support um, the, the students through this work. And that's why we're um, definitely highlighting, as Dr. Williams said, this wonderful principal sitting here to my right. Yeah, and the project graduation sounds amazing. It, how long has that been around? Oh, we've been doing project. Oh, jeez. Oh, you, now you're testing my memory, and I'm old. Uh, we've probably been doing it for probably about eight or nine years uh, now. We used to scrunch all of the principals together in these little spaces but now every year we try to progress with that work and so now we're doing it more individualized in schools I have I have one meeting tomorrow at Overly High School at 8 o'clock uh, in the morning so uh, the, the principal and their teams are, are doing a wonderful job to support our students and as you see the data says our we know our L students are our, our students who struggle the most, but as you can see, we are making gains with them, um, lowering the dropout rate, increasing the graduation rate, and, and it's that multi, multidisciplinary approach is assisting us uh, with, with that work as well. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation and um, for your time and being here. Um, my question was, I saw where it was over three years of data, um, I just wanted to know, did you all follow any of these kids or anything as far as them going to um, college? Are they still there? Have they graduated? If I guess if it was a two years um, uh, school, um, or does it just end at them being accepted into college? So the data that we have right here is um, related to acceptance into college. That's that's what we what we shared today. So certainly the National Clearinghouse data would show the persistence. So once kids actually enrolled and then the persistence, we did not share that data today. Okay. I was just curious about that, how many um, after they got in were there completing, graduating, and still there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? 
Ms. Poslowski, congratulations. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm curious, how many faculty members do you have currently? About? About 103. Okay. And do, now for those, you know, I taught there for 25 years. It, it looks to me like you're keeping a, a core of teachers that are staying there. And, and do you see there's a, a possible correlation there of teachers staying there and getting more experience and being better at their skill, you know, developing a better skill set and being better with, you know, developing the relationships? You think there's something going on there? Yeah, just the teachers that get to know our community, they know where the <coughs> students live. Um, and we also have had two new employees in the next in the last two months that were graduates of Chesapeake, which I think is really interesting because they've came back to school. My new assistant principal, Holly Coleman, is a, a Bayhawk, and we hired a Spanish teacher that she was a Bayhawk too. So I think that that's and we think we have three others on staff too, which I think really speaks to people want to come back into the community. It is the hidden gem of the East Side. And and <laughs> and. You know, at-risk kind of kids are harder to develop relationships with. And so I felt that I was a better teacher the last five years of my career than I was before that. Uh, and I, th I think that because that, that teenager's, you know, hard to get to know, the better the teacher is at their skills development, then they can reach those kids and maybe through those connections with, with how you talked, everybody had somebody, they might have more than one. I agree. I think we have so many um, faculty members that have touch points on different kids. And someone mentioned, you know, when they come into our school and they see the, the teachers in the hallway, they aren't just standing there back. We're engaging with the students all throughout the hallway and in classes and just keeping everyone involved. And we really keep a real big pulse about what's happening in the building, which I think has been instrumental this year to making sure we get the students what they need, whether it's in the building or we get them resources that are outside. And when they have those relationships, those tight relationships with the kids, then that's to me is when they can really help them. You know, whether it's calling them out on their behavior or assisting them in, you know, whatever it is that they need to be successful. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes, do we have the. We're having trouble hearing you, Ms. Rowe. Would you mind speaking up? Okay, sorry. That's much Do better. Do we have data on how many students enter college and need to take remedial courses? Hi, Ms. Rowe. Um, part of uh, the MOU that we're crafting with CCBC is to be able to share information as one of our um, most uh, substantial you know, transitions from 12th grade students is to go to CCBC. And through that MOU and data sharing agreement, part of that will be able to inform us of students who uh, transition to the CCBC program and the number of students who need to take remedial courses as well as the student success, um, and including those students that the percentage that did not need to do so. Um, and we disaggregate that by student group and by high school. Okay, and what do we do um, to track students who um, are not accepted into colleges? Do we attempt to find out if they've found work or some other training program? So just from that perspective that you just shared, some students go um, on college, some choose career, some choose service. Uh, we have many different pathways, and we are taking great pride in, in promoting, um, you know, a, a variety of different enrichment and acceleration pathways for college and career readiness for our students. As far as tracking all of that data, I'm going to ask Ms. Ferguson if she has any insight to share as well. At this time, what we do have is we have the senior survey, so we do know where they intend to go. Um, so that's why we do have some data related to military, world of work, or college at this time. Um, we do not have the data related to whether or not a student who chose to go to work, if that student is actually working. Um, what we can access is the National Clearinghouse data, 
which shows whether or not a child enrolled in college and is persisting in college. Um, we don't have that information for World of Work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation and thank you for um, sharing the successes of, of your school. We um, really appreciate that. Um, so with the discrepancies in the uh, graduation rates, if you could put up slide um, eight, please. And then um, flip flip to slide five, uh, where a significant um, number of students are English learners, whether they're uh, Hispanic, Latino, or English learners. We have so many other um, uh, nations represented, languages represented. We have a wonderful amount of cultural diversity here. Uh, we understand that the um, ESOL programs are supposed to be moving from regional centers to the home schools. And I believe Dr. Williams had told us when, when a future um, report was going to be on that. Um, how is that going to be helpful to our English language learners and what other supports are being planned? That's my question, so thank you. Um, so we're very um, excited about um, building more robust opportunities and supports around our English learners of whatever language background. Um, and part of as we move from a center model towards students matriculating in their own home community, um, we will be for those schools providing a full year of professional learning in advance of those students arriving at their home school. That professional learning will um, be extensive and one of the primary functions we will do is to teach uh, our general educators how do you support English learners in their classroom um, and also supporting those schools in building their schedules and resources to support uh, various levels of English proficiency, students uh, at different L levels, if you will, uh, throughout um, their schedule and the resources within their building. And so that is part of what we will be doing um, to help our students. You know, right now, our English learners who attend a center um, not only um, are transported some distance from their home community to attend their academic program, but it also makes it very challenging for them to stay after school for tutoring. It makes it very challenging for them to participate in extracurriculars and athletics uh, because of that distance between their home and where their academic program is. So as students are able to matriculate in their home communities, that really opens up an abundance of resources. We know simultaneously uh, uh, with community schools that we have more and more schools that will be building in wraparound services as well that can be customized to the needs of the schools. So as we have um, schools identify, you know, have um, English learner populations at their home schools, we can also build supports through community schools to help those students and their, their families in the broader community as well. So it's, it's really a multifaceted approach. Thank you for that. Thank you. I'm going to jump around real quick. So um, earlier in the report, it, we were talking about the dropout rate and um, supports that try to help the students to not drop out. But the word I didn't hear in um, how that analysis was done is, um, or in was parents, family, or guardians, um, and also relating back to the ELL and having those children being able to be served in their communities what additional resources or programs or outreach uh, do we need to do to really get those parents and family members or guardians engaged as early as possible, as often as possible, to support uh, the family and the student? Um, so um, one of the things that a lot of our principals are doing is reaching out to some of the community-based organizations to provide support, and that's really working well well uh, in those communities. So when they are when they are teaming up, when these community-based uh, uh, organizations, then they're having. Um, 
and, and especially prior to the pandemic, we, uh, we were on a very good roll with this work because we were having community meetings in the school buildings. We were hosting different events in the school buildings. We were utilizing support uh, from our social workers and our counselors uh, with regards to some of the, um, uh, what, what, were the, what are the kitchens names that, that we're uh, opening up, uh, Kim, providing us uh, food support uh, services um, through that? With the food banks. Yes, with, with the, with the uh, food banks. Uh, so some of those community organizations were helping us to reach out to those families to bring them into the schools. Because, of course, we were having the language barriers. We were always tapping into our world languages, teachers. And so now when we're able to use the community organizations in order for us to facilitate those relationships with the parents, we're seeing some very, very positive gains with the number of uh, Hispanic speaking families coming into the schools. And so those are things that we're, we're trying to get ramped up once again. Once Dr. Williams told us um, the, the doors are open, we need to bring the visitors in. So, so that's what our principals are really trying to do, trying to utilize the supports of those community organizations, because we know that there was some relationship issues. Um, that we, there are some, some good things that happened with the centers, but there are also a lot of cons that uh, Dr. Boswell McComas uh, talked about. So we want to ensure that we go follow through uh, with the plan that Dr. Williams has outlined for us and ensure that as we um, open up the centers and the students are matriculating back to their home schools, that the principals and their staffs in those home schools are prepared uh, for their students. And uh, as Mr. Thomas stated, uh, we saw some great gains in the VLP program from our L students. So again, another initiative that we are about to roll out, uh, Dr. Williams uh, put on our table to reimagine the use of time. Um, so the communities are going to see some letters uh, from some of our school and some of them our ESOL centers where they're, they're going to have their own distance learning program within the schools to support our L students because they've already demonstrated that virtual learning is um, a way that they have been successful with their work. So we're, 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 we're thinking outside of the box, as I should say. Uh, we, we're having weekly meetings with um, Dr. Yarborough and Dr. Zarching around that work. And so hopefully uh, once we come back to you next year as a, as a school board, we'll be able to say some more gains, reduction in the dropout rate and a significant increase in the graduation rate. So uh, I'm looking forward to the work. Uh, again, principals like Amy um, are, are doing some wonderful work and, and the principals who are in charge of the ESOL centers are going to assist Dr. Boswell McComas with the professional development to the homeschool principal. So, uh, lo looking forward to the work, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to share some wonderful news with uh, you, Ms. Causey, and the rest of the uh, board members. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? Hearing none. Thank you all very much. Thank Outstanding you. presentation. Thank Have a great evening. evening. The next item on the agenda is information items which include the financial report for February 2022, the revised FY 2022 school calendar, which reflects the new election date in July, and a correction to the commencement end date in June, and the update on key school legislation. Yes, Mrs. Causey? Thank you. I just wanted to have a, a clearer um, for the calendar, what the revision is. We know anything about the calendar can um, be very exciting. So we just, I just wanted to understand fully what that was because I looked over it and I didn't see any highlighted, any highlighted changes. I, I just summarized the changes to the calendar. I'm sorry, could you repeat them? They're, they're in information. The calendar and the changes that I just read are in, from, in information. Did, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. 
The next item on the agenda is board member comments and consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. Um, board members, please note that items at past meetings have been received and are being reviewed. Ms. Rowe? I have no items, thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Ms. Rowe? No, th no, thank you. It's late. We'll let people go. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Causey? Thank you. I would like to um, hear a presentation on how the uh, school system is working with our area councils, but also PTA and other um, school organizations to really, um, especially after the pandemic, um, engage with parents, guardians, families, with their students in order to um, promote and recover, but to increase uh, academic achievement. Um, I wanted to just take a moment to say I was deeply moved by the comments we heard earlier. The situation regarding students and staff being injured at school is heartbreaking. And I know that we have just dedicated staff that will do anything, jump in the middle of students fighting to try and make things better for students. And I just really hope that uh, we're going to have some time to talk about that as well. Um, I, Dr. Williams made some points tonight and um, I would like to hear more because this is a very serious um, issue and um, it, that's all I'll say about that um, at this time. I was also encouraged to be at the National School Board Association Conference uh, this last weekend um, with Mr. Thomas and other board members. It really was a time to connect and get re-inspired about why we do the hard work nationwide. It's been a very difficult time for um, education and for the students and the families and the staff and for the boards and the administrative staff that are here late at night talking about all these things. So um, that was wonderful. and. There is a lot of work still to be done, and I am, I am re-inspired and dedicated to uh, to get it done. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Um, thank you. Hope everyone has a good spring break um, and take time to recharge and uh, rest. Um, this month is Earth Day, and it's also Water Week this month. So with that, I would like to add to the agenda our lead in the school water uh, updates and uh, next steps to reduce out annual costs on um, bottled water and from both fiscal point of view and also from an environmental sustainability um, point. So thank you and good night. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Um, yes, as far as comments, I was pleased to see the presentation on Lansdowne High School. I know that many of you on the board um, even before you were on the board, advocated for a new Lansdowne High School. I know that community members and Lansdowne High School staff advocated for many, many years. And I want to acknowledge that advocacy and the hard work of BCPS staff that allowed this to become a reality. I, I know people are very excited. And as far as agenda items, um, I would like to see a presentation on retention trends over five years that includes the number of students retained each year at elementary school, middle school, and high school, broken out by the student groups that are shown on slide four of the graduation presentation and any reasons for retention. And I'd also like to see an informational presentation on watershed um, charter school that includes um, data like MCAP, MAP, attendance, um, both standalone data and how watershed compares to our non-charter elementary schools. Thank you, and um, please, everybody, have a great um, break. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I want to echo the comments about a spring break. It's a very deserving uh, time away for people. I'd like to see something on the virtual learning program and what we're going to do with it next year, and if it's going to increase or decrease or just an update on the virtual learning program. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Thank you, Ms. Hen. Uh, some of the things I'd like to see are, one, uh, I think someone might, today we had the conversation about the Pikesville High School contract for the track and field, and it did bring up that question of equity and how our, our track and fields and how all of our schools are being funded by private sources or from our legislatures, and maybe I want to see a, w a way that we can kind of figure out how we are, we can, I don't know, 
make sure we're equitably using those private funds. Another one was um, in the equity committee, we talked a lot about providing opportunities or the equity council meeting um, for more stakeholders to participate. Uh, it was mentioned a few times to have board meetings set, move around the county, but I think it might be better to just have a virtual option for our stakeholders to give public comment um, because we have 10 slots and so they could be a hybrid of virtual or in person. Like, you know, we as board members are hybrid of virtual and in person. And lastly, um, I'll say it again, uh, the procurement of a contract that would allow for us to have more safety features in our buses, more cameras, um, and would allow for live streaming of cameras so that our principals and administrators can see what's happening in our schools in live time um, and be able to assist our bus drivers and our staff members in managing those safety issues. So with that, good night, everyone, and thank you for tuning into this meeting. Thank what is you. This? Ms. Scott? Thank you. Um, I, well, again, I wish everyone a wonderful spring break. A um, couple things. I, would I too, attended the National um, School Board Association uh, conference, and I was happy to work with Mae um, on educational equity and to present the um, equity lens there that we, we all have this at our, at our desk. And um, it's something that was created um, by Mae as a lens or filter um, by which we should um, um, uh, measure our, our work through and, and give um, thought to. So it was very nice to share this with um, other boards from across the nation. Um, also, I would like to mention in the um, in equity also at our last um, equity council meeting, we had a, presenta a presentation by Ms. Um, Ramadan Chinawi, and she was able to provide background information and debunk myths and stereotypes about Arab and Muslim students, discuss the importance of countering anti-Muslim harassment and bias in schools, and review strategies on how to help increase awareness on creating safe school environments for Muslim and Arab students. And that was very informational, informational to all of us, and it was titled The Duality of Arab and Muslim Students. So I think that we're doing some really good work there. Thank you to the committee and to Ms. Um, Sanawi and um, to everyone who's been participating as we grow and learn. And lastly, I would also like to thank Dr. Williams and um, also Dr. Scrivens before he left uh, in um, working to make sure that the basketball hoops were up in the fourth district because that's something that has not been up at the schools it's been up in other parts of baltimore county but not up in the fourth so it um, became an issue of inequity and they are up now and it is has been well received and so i thank you for coming up with the program and executing that so that um, we can have equity throughout um, baltimore county so that's it thank you all very much thank you dr hager um, thank you. I just want to give a plug for our uh, local school health council in Baltimore County. So there, um, I've <laughs> mentioned this before, that there's a state school health council, and then each district has a local school health council. And um, and they do a lot of really great work, and it's a legislated entity among the Department of Health and, and uh, local school system. And so I think it would be great to hear from the school health council at some point to hear what, what they're working on. Um, and one thing that they often have focused on over the years is water access. So I was going to bring up water access as well, and that's often where um, that has been discussed in the past. I think it should be discussed in the full board as well. Um, but that is, uh, I know, often where, where it gets discussed. So I don't know if that's worth um, connecting those dots. And I was not able to attend the Lansdowne design presentation. And I'd love to, I look forward to seeing it, though I know it's not posted yet, but I'm looking forward to seeing that. Oh, it is posted. The video is still up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, that leaves my comments. And I just want to first thank um, my fellow board colleagues, especially for their hard work in each of the committees. Our committees are working extremely hard. I want you to know that I see you and for staff for supporting our board committees. I know the harder our board members work, the harder you work, and that's an understatement. So thank you all for supporting our board members with their work on the committees. If I could attend each one of those meetings, I would, because I just love you know, tuning in and hearing about all the amazing work you're, you're doing in your um, committees. That's when a lot of our work happens, and I know that um, we can be de rather demanding on staff at, at times, and that's an understatement as well. So thank you for your work in supporting us. Um, thank you to our school staff um, sticking in there. We're counting down with you for, for spring break. Um, hope you have a wonderful spring break. And that concludes my comments. So.
Thank you all. Which takes us to our final item on the agenda, get everybody home, and that is announcements. The board will hold a special virtual meeting on Tuesday, April 26th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. More information may be found on the board's participation by the public website or in board docs in this agenda item. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>